Call to order the City of Lincoln City City Council meeting, April 9th, 2012. Roll call, please. Mayor Dick Anderson. Here. Gordon Eagleton. Here. Gary Ellingson. He's just excused temporarily. He'll be joining us. Chester Norikis. Here. Roger Sprague. Here. Henry Quant. Here. And Alex Ward. Here. Please stand for Pledge Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. The Republic stands one nation, indivisible, with liberty. This would be the time for comments from citizens present. Uh, the purpose of comments from citizens is to allow citizens to present information or raise an issue regarding items not on the agenda or regarding agenda items that do not include a public hearing. A time limit of five minutes per citizen shall apply. I've asked the city recorder to utilize the light system so that the speaker will be informed as to their remaining time and so that we have consistency. As a general rule, this is not a time for an exchange of questions, however, at the conclusion of this agenda item, the counselors can discuss or raise questions regarding something presented by a citizen. And we have a sign up. Um, and this would be the time with uh, Cheryl Johnson to present, come forward. Uh, there is, uh, I see your note, the dog park uh, topic and that is on the agenda but not necessarily for public you know comment so now would be now is definitely the right time yeah and we just ask you to talk right into the mic and name and address would be great my name is Cheryl Johnson um, I live at 1324 Southwest 69th Street Lincoln City Oregon and obviously I'm here for a dog park I think it's a great idea um, some of the benefits of a dog park, it gives the dog owners a safe place for their dogs to exercise, run free in a supervised, in a, an enclosed area. Obviously, in a, there would be no cars, bikes, skateboarders, and things like that. Um, it encourages responsible pet ownership. It provides an opportunity for dog owners to learn from observation and from more experienced dog owners. The dog park is both physically and mentally stimulating to the dogs. It reduces um, destructive and annoying behaviors such as barking or jumping up on people. And behavior problems are one of the uh, leading causes for dogs to be turned into animal shelters, so it helps in that area also. It provides seniors and disabled community members with an accessible place to exercise their pets. It provides for socialization for both the dogs and their owners and strengthens their bond with the community and many dog owners will walk around the inside perimeter of dog parks to exercise themselves while their dogs are also exercising leading to you know fitness and mental you know and well-being um, and it's more likely in a dog park that you're going to encounter other people that enjoy dogs versus being in a park where somebody's got their dog loose running around and and jumping at you and things like that um, and having a, a tired dog is often a happy dog because then they're not looking for other ways to entertain themselves that aren't as um, positive. Um, it doesn't require a lot, you know, other than land. Um, what I've read is a minimum of one acre per, for, two, for each area for a large animal and a small dog area. It requires um, a fenced area, four to six feet, um, preferably a, a double-gated entrance. Um, it should have a suitable water source and ideally a shaded area. Having adequate drainage would help preserve the soil quality and maintain cleanliness. For comfort and enjoyment of the people there, um, a picnic bench or, or table would be nice to have, as well as having a receptacle and plastic bags for picking up the obvious and having adequate parking. Um, having a dog park would be um, beneficial for the city economically. Um, many hotels, resorts, and that are pet friendly in many businesses, and more and more people are traveling with their pets. Um, if I was coming to Lincoln City and, you know, or the coast and looking at Lincoln City or Newport, Newport has two dog parks, and Lincoln City has none. Um, I think people would spend, you know, their 
spending motel rooms, restaurant, you know, shops, and that, and that would bring help some of the economy here. A dog park could also help um, Lincoln City become part of a be a destination town. And on a daily basis, um, local businesses are being asked where a dog park is located in Lincoln City. Research has also shown more and more potential homeowners are considering the availability of a dog park when they're considering moving to a community. Um, other groups such as skateboarders, softball, baseball teams have been given special consideration in view of their unique needs. And I believe that the cons this consideration should also be given for a dog park here on Lincoln City. Um, I have been circulating petitions around Lincoln City um, asking people if they're just interested in having a dog park. Um, I have collected 696 signatures. And I've only heard positive comments from everybody that I've talked to and any of the businesses that have had their petitions in their business that they've said it's just been well received. And it, one person said, this is the easiest petition that I've ever dealt with because people were wanting to sign it. Um, I've gone to the park, Lincoln City Parks and Recreation Board, and they've been supportive and asked that the city council to consider um, helping establish a, a dog park here in Lincoln City. And I've also contacted the mayor and have some come up. And I know that he um, supports the idea of the dog park. Um, I'm planning on creating a Facebook page in the future. And there are some people here that have come to help to show that there's support for, the, for a dog park and if they would stand to let people know. Nice to see. And I just hope that you'll help support and help to have us a dog park here in Lincoln City. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Now, I, I know it's not by coincidence that there's a agenda item called dog parks here later on. I'm assuming you're going to stay uh, for that uh, discussion. Sure. I will. Great. All right. We may have to call on your expertise. Much. Anyone else uh, wish to make comments um, at this time? Okay. Then uh, we have the next item is the consent agenda. The consent agenda, these items are considered routine and may be enacted in one motion without separate discussion. Any counselor may request that an item be removed for separate discussion and action. The consent agenda consists of, one, request to read ordinances first by title only, two, by MART agreement, three, Oregon legal control license, a new outlet license for Delhi 101 LLC. Number four is resolution number 2012-07, amendment number two, memorandum of agreement, Confederated Tribes of Sluts Indians. Number five is 2012 Fund Exchange Agreement, Lincoln City Overlay Storm and Sidewalk Project. And number six, Rental Agreement, Commercial Space, First Floor. Mr. Right. Mayor? Yes. I would like to pull uh, number five. Number five. <coughs> Any others to pull separately? Yes, Mr. Mayor, number two and number four. Two and four. All right. Any others? With that, then I'd entertain a motion to approve the consent agendas consisting of 1, 3, and 6. So moved. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda consisting of items 1, 3, and 6. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed with a nay. Hearing none. All right. Um, Chester, would you mind uh, number two, the Bymart Agreement? Mr. Hawker, under Section 5, Bymart obligations regarding uh, Pacific Power Blue Sky Program. Uh -huh. uh, is there no limitation on that? Is there no, we eliminated the three-year expectation? Right, right. And we replaced it with nothing? Right. They go as long as we go. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Now, if that, if in their judgment that that becomes something that 
they have a better alternative for or they think that no longer works, they can always come to us and ask for an amendment. All right. I'm, I'm not suggesting they do. Um, Understood. Right now, we think it's a good program, but uh, there's other options always available. Thank you. Uh, I would move, Mr. Mayor, that we accept consent agenda number item number two uh, by MART Agreement Lead Standard. Second. We have a motion to approve the by MART Agreement and a second. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed with a nay. Hearing none. Sir, would you stay with the resolution number um, that discussion? Yes, number four on the consent agenda memorandum of, of agreement. I noticed in our packet, Mr. Hawker, that the amendment to the memorandum of agreement has Rick Brissett's name at the bottom of it. What are we looking Wait. at? I'm sorry. The I can address that. All right. That was actually changed. You have the first version of it, so it's been corrected. Thank All you right. for bringing that to our Good. attention. Thank you. Uh, I would move that we accept item number four on the consent agenda. I move that we accept that. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion to approve resolution number 201207, amendment two, memorandum of agreement, Confederated Tribes of Sluts Indians. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed with a nay. Hearing none. Thank you. And Mr. Sprague, uh, item number five. The only reason that I asked to pull that is that uh, it, if you were looking at it the first time and didn't understand what it was about, uh, it would be very ambiguous. But uh, I just think that the, for the public's uh, benefit that it's a good idea to explain what that, uh, what that program is because it doesn't specifically talk about a specific project. Excellent point. Um, um, It's boy. I wish Lila were not sick and were able to hear talk about this. But I agree with you. It 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 it's pretty obtuse when you look at it. Um, it's it's a condition of us receiving uh, federal funds that are washed through the state. Okay, it's a, I believe it's an annual event. Uh, it goes into our capital uh, projects. Um, it's just a requirement um, to get the funds. It's just funds available for us to, uh, to use on uh, street and road projects. Yeah, it's an annual budget, uh, revenue budget that we that we have. Uh, it varies year to year. I just thought an explanation of that was. That's uh, about the best that I can do. I don't know the in intricacies of how this works. These federal and state dollars. Um, I haven't dug into that. Why why they need something like this, I have no idea. Well, I know the feds give the state money, and the, and the state takes a little bit out of it for themselves, and then we get the other 84% or whatever it is. 94%. Uh, 94. Uh, and that, that's exactly what this shows, is the state, for the funds passing through the state to get to us, they take a haircut. They take their chunk. That, yeah. and it, that was even true with the federal stimulus funds that, that all got passed through the state. They made all the decisions. Um, I, I believe a lot of them were political decisions, and they took 5 or 6% off the top. And we still have a deficit. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I move that we uh, uh, pass the uh, uh, number 5. All right. Do we have a second? I'll second it. So we have a motion with a second to uh, approve the 2012 fund exchange agreement between Lincoln City Overlay Storm and Sidewalk Project. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed with an A. Hearing none. Thank you. Next item of business is actually uh, uh, special presentations, and we're fortunate tonight to have a presentation on the Children's Advocacy Center. And Pam, if you'd like to come forward, appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for allowing me to come this evening. Um, Would you mind giving us your sure. name and title and where you're from and all that good stuff? I'm Pam Salisbury. I'm director of the Children's Advocacy Center. 
uh, that serves all of Lincoln County. Um, the center is actually located in Newport to be close to the courthouse um, because grand jury previously met for children at the center and we're about to bring it back. So we're located in Newport, but we serve all of the county. Um, this is Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month. And so it's a time in April for us to go out in the community and raise awareness about the problem of child abuse. Um, it's also the time to celebrate the role that the communities play in protecting our children. Child abuse includes physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, witness to violence, and drug endangerment. Uh, typically, there are more than 5,000 Oregon children confirmed as victims of child abuse each year. Lincoln County um, has the second highest rate of child abuse in this state. We're at 298 percentile, which means bad, worse. Um, the Children's Advocacy Center has provided assessment and intervention to over 2,500 suspected victims in Lincoln County since opening in 1997. So we're almost 15 years old. One in four girls and one in five boys before the age of 18 will be abused. The sad thing is only one in 10 of those will ever tell anyone. And that one has to tell or talk about it nine times before somebody will listen. So those children that we're seeing in this county is just a very small proportion of the victims that are out there. The center referrals continue to increase. In the la last year, our volumes increased 53%. In the first three months of this year, we have more than doubled the number of referrals um, than we saw last year. Now, that could be a good sign. It could be that people are more aware and people are reporting and the kids are able to come in and start to begin to receive the services that they need. Uh, last year, we served 200 children for assessment and intervention, um, and which also includes counseling and family support. A third of our referrals come from Lincoln City, <clears throat> and that's typical across the years. A hundred percent of our victims know their offender. Nationwide, the statistic is about 97% but we don't have a problem of stranger danger. The center works with community partners as part of the Lincoln County Child Abuse Multidisciplinary Team. And that team meets twice a month to review each of the child abuse cases in the county. And Lincoln City um, detectives sit on that group and Chief Bouchard is a uh, member of the policy team for our multidisciplinary team. The other members of the team include uh, Department of Health Services and Indian Child Welfare. The school district sits on that team, County Mental Health, Lincoln County Juvenile Department, and the district attorney's office, as well as the children's advocacy representatives. And as I said, we meet twice a month. Um, in, um, we are just launching this month, uh, the month of child abuse prevention, a new program, Trainings, uh, Darkness to Light Stewards for Children, and we will be holding the first Lincoln City training on Thursday, May 17th from 3 to 6 at the Driftwood Library. Uh, this is an interactive training program for adults on protecting children. Um, in Lincoln County, we must build a sense of community interconnectedness where what affects one affects all, where bystanders play an active role in preventing abuse, and adults must take responsibility to intervene. 
We cannot leave it to our children to protect themselves. Organizations dealing with children need a child abuse prevention plan that includes screening and supervision of children, number one, a policy regarding adult child contact. And why that's important, 80% of sexual abuse cases occur in one adult and one child situations. Number three, we need to make sure that our staffs and volunteers are trained to recognize the signs of abuse and then have a clear plan for reporting suspected abuse. So each organization that deals with children <coughs> should have those policies and plans. We ask that you watch and listen and believe our children. Everyone's participation is critical. As a community, we must raise awareness and strengthen families in our efforts to prevent child abuse and neglect. Every child deserves love, respect, guidance, safety, and praise. Let's all believe that getting it right early is less costly than trying to fix it later. A recent study came out that without intervention, the societal long-term consequences of abuse are profound. It is costing our country $124 billion of lifetime costs for just one year's worth of victims. It has been proven that early childhood trauma uh, from um, abuse is re resulting in teen pregnancies, alcohol and drug abuse, the high number of people smoking, obesity, heart disease, depression, and um, suicidal attempts. So the impact on society is great if we're not um, identifying these victims and providing them with intervention. We encourage all individuals and organizations to play a role in making Lincoln County, including Lincoln City, a better place for families by ensuring that parents have the knowledge, skills, and resources they need to care for their children. We can help prevent child abuse and neglect by strengthening families in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the goal certainly was to help promote uh, a wider awareness, that's, and hopefully, that's right. certainly, you've got council's attention. But the positive thing is uh, the audience um, where this council meeting is televised, and right. we've reached a, a much wider uh, public audience tonight. So we appreciate. I uh, thank you. The numbers are staggering, um, and I again. It, Really appreciate you sharing them with us, and uh, you know would like to be kept in the loop as to okay. progress. Great. Are there any any questions, Council? I have a question. Uh, of all of those that were reported, how many convictions actually came out of that? Um, I can't. There's quite a few plea bargains. Um, the um, number of children in Lincoln County that. Um, um, they're going to trial or they're being pled. Um, the number of, of children going to grand jury has increased over the last couple of years. Um, I don't have a statistic um, of actually the percentage. Uh, I believe that there are those that do go to trial. There's a high rate of um, conviction. Good. Other questions? Great. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming forward. Our next uh, presentation is for Guy Faust on the Community Development Block Grant Micro Enterprise Report slash Request. 
My name is Guy Faust. I'm the Small Business Development Center Director at Oregon Coast Community College and also Micro Enterprise Director. Um, I'm here for two reasons. One is to report what the uh, 2011 Community Development Block Grant, uh, what we've done, and I'm here to request uh, your continued support of $5,000 for 2012. I feel a little empty-handed. Uh, generally at this time, I have a report and it lists all the different people that have been involved in the program, the number of hours uh, we've served, and how many people we've helped from what parts of the county they've come from, and what kinds of businesses they've started or are in. Um, this year I can't do that. And the reason I can't do that is because the entire community development block grant uh, timeline has changed. It flipped like six months. And so when I say I'm giving a report for 2011, it's because we were notified in December 2011 that our application had been funded. Um, we did not uh, start the grant. It was executed on uh, January 31st. So actually, we've been in business since February. So uh, we've been at it about two months. Um, the reason for the change is basically, uh, I guess you call it bureaucratic. Um, before you can apply for funding, you have to be 70% spent down before the next year. And um, because of the changes in how they interpreted um, their guidelines. Um, we were not able, in fact, we were not the only ones around the state, but a number of programs were not able to fund it when we normally would and have it in June and get started in August. So we're about six months behind is where we were last year. Um, but here's what I can say is that our contract goal is to serve 25 clients over the, the uh, course of 12 months. We've already enrolled 30. Um, we have at least 20 adults and we have um, 10 students at the Neighbors for Kids program in Depot Bay that are involved in a youth entrepreneurship program. Um, out of the the adults, uh, more than a third are from the North County. And uh, of the kids that are involved in the Kids Zone or in the uh, Neighbors for Kids program, um, eight of the ten are either from South <coughs> High School or Career Tech. So the North is being represented very well at this moment. I would imagine before the grant is over, we'll probably serve uh, somewhere between 35 and 40 clients. And again, our contract goal is only 25. Um, this is our eighth year of getting a grant from the state through Community Development Block Grant. Uh, we're the only county in the state that has received a grant for eight years in a row. And our current grant is $51,000. Um, over the last eight years, we brought in over a half a million dollars uh, from state funding to help micro entrepreneurs. And the reason why, at least the reason I believe we are, have been successful, is because of the coalition that we have amongst the county and the three cities. Uh, city of Lincoln City, City of Newport, City of Walport, and the county have all put in hard money into this program. And because of that, um, it basically puts us in an advantageous position uh, around the state. So it's our goal again this year is to um, apply again and hopefully find out in December that uh, we will be accepted and get the program started basically in 2013, but I need to be before you now uh, to be able to uh, ask for your request. So that's the report, that's the request. Are there any questions? Guy, would you mind just uh, briefly what some of the things, uh, you know, what happens to the clients um, that you enroll? How is the money leveraged? 
What's happened in the past, again, the, the rules have changed. In the past, we could use the funding for two purposes. One is training. And basically, we would scholarship them for different classes. And it could also be used for business advising. Well, those rules changed a couple years ago. Now, no longer can you use the money for business advising. And trust me, the, the folks that are taking our classes... Um, they need the advising more than the training. Some of them didn't do too well the first time around in school, and, and here they're asked to learn, you know, business concepts. And so what, what we did in the past is we used the local funding for leveraging. Now we use the local funding for the one-to-one -one business advising, or call it tutoring, after that class has taken place. And so that is where... That's where the need is, and that's where our request for help is. That's great. Other questions, David? Yeah, I, I'm just a tiny bit confused on your funding cycle and the, how it was laid and what we've paid for what period and what you're asking for what period. It, it, it all gets it's gotten jumbled up in my head here from listening. Traditionally, <coughs> traditionally, um, I would be here at this time. The funding would be approved, uh, and we would start. Basically, they would execute the contract in July, and so it would go for a uh, fiscal year. Um, this year, because it's required to have a 70% spend down before you can apply, that spend down was not achieved until um, at the end of September. So we could not apply for these until uh, early October. So they notified us in December that we had received the funding. So the, the program has not been continuous? It has been continuous. Well, yeah, you could say there's been sort of a six month gap. Okay. Uh, and how's our funding fit into that six month gap, I guess is where I'm headed. Well, before it was just right in sync. And right. The program would start in July, and the funding would start in July. Right. Now the program basically starts in January. But I need to request now for it to kick in for next year. We're just a half. We're just six months off. Is basically what it is. I'll try my best to figure that out. So this is your re request for funding for next year? Yes, for uh, our, our fiscal well, year. Well, for 2012-13, for because this kicks in in 13. And, and have we made a payment for the current fiscal year? I believe so. I believe I, so, I, too. And that's I guess that's what I'm asking. If we're full funding every year and there's been a, a gap, I, I don't understand why our funding is the same with or without the gap. I don't know how to answer that other than if if uh, if I came here n next year at this time, the program would have already started. It would have started in January. And w there would be no funding. Now, I think I understand that. Um, if we continuously, and we have for years, funded $5,000 a year for a 12-month program, and there's been a period of time that there's not a 12-month, there's a six-month program. Well, no, it, it, it's still 12 months. We're, we're going to be running the program from January through December this next year. It's a 12-month program. So you'll but be going. It, oh, excuse me. But it sounds like we've got six months credit, is what I'm hearing. I'm, I think so. I'm Sir not Harper sure. saying, since you weren't running for six months and we paid for twelve. Now I'm confused. We've we've been. Everything has been on the same schedule, up until this year. This year the program, I guess. Yeah. 
I'm trying to figure out when when the program was actually concluded by the state of Oregon. It, it was in uh, the fourth quarter. So this year has run longer, I guess. We haven't paid you yet this year. I just got a note. This fiscal year. Because we haven't gotten an invoice. I so, don't know. It's, that's through our business department. So okay. I would um, have I'm, I, again, I'm just trying to figure out how this all all works, and we don't need to do that tonight. Um, Other than, you know, I guess a consensus, you know, from council, because if nothing else, we want to get it as an item into the budget, right, for the one coming up in June, the next fiscal year, 2012-2013. Yeah. Correct. Yes. You'd like yes, to, that's, you'd like that, to that's see, us, see us nod and say, yes, you know, <laughs> put it in the budget, and it adds value. And, I, again, remembering it, it has uh, – it's great leverage for $5,000 uh, for the small business touch. And Other questions? I, I just want to say I was not being picky or argumentative. I, I strongly supported this program. It's growing businesses are one of the best things we can do. Yep. Other questions from council? Could I have a, you know, just a consensus of council to that you're in agreement, not necessarily voting because we'll it'll be in, Absolutely. but to make sure it gets its way to the budget. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guy, for coming. Good luck with working with CB, <laughs> community block grant. All right, we have, uh, next item is leak detection equipment. Huh? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm just getting back on my... <laughs> uh, three. Leak number nine? Oh, I'm down with paragraph, excuse me. <coughs> Again, Lila was going to present this, but as ill, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pinch hit. And Dave Scheib, our water... Um, Distribution uh, supervisors here for any questions that I can't handle. Uh, we every piece of equipment that detects leaks, different capabilities. Um, it was key to us to try to get demonstrations of their capabilities and how that equipment would work with our existing equipment. And that's been a real struggle. Um, some of the companies that offer the equipment will not demo it. Um, I guess there's not enough profit or they're selling something else that makes more profit. Uh, anyway, uh, one system was evaluated. It, it's the low bid of the two uh, from fluid uh, conservation systems. I believe that was actually an initial bid uh, from, I believe was it Fergus? here in case I need some help on this. You've been dying to do this anyway. <laughs> you didn't bring it with you. I, was <laughs> I saw you there. <laughs> Sit down. Why, why don't you go through what your experience was in trying to get demos and... Yeah, just speak right into it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I had a lot of trouble getting people to demo it um, the one that did I did get to demo it um, that vendor that I was going to purchase it through no longer exists and then there was another type of one I was going to tr I was trying to demo and he said exactly what Mr. Hawker said um, there wasn't enough money in it for them and they were in Washington um, they ended up, the company that it owns the equipment that has the equipment and makes the equipment, not the vendor itself that I was trying to get it through, took it away from them. And at the last minute, I found out they had it. They, I could get it. Um, demoing it, on the other hand, was a little more difficult. Um, but from what I found with the FCS, the fluid con conservation one, um, bar none, I spoke to a lot of different cities, Portland, Corvallis, Albany, uh, Salem. 
I got references from them. I spoke to Albany in particular um, in length, and it is a... They found what I had already known about it since we demoed it. Uh, found a pretty substantial leak up on Schooner Creek um, that we could not find for many years. It was uh, underneath that slide. I think we you all know about that. Um, let's see what else. Oh, there was another vendor on a, a di totally different piece of equipment. Uh, I believe it was Metrotech. Um, I was interested in it. It was a little cheaper. Um, I personally didn't care for the quality. And I asked more information. They sent me a four-page flyer. And I asked him for any more information he had, and he had no idea because he had never sold one. So I, it was you're kind of every corner you turn, you're hitting a brick wall. But uh, the, lo the long and short of it is, is we are asking for the low bid. Uh, it's the best piece of equipment. Uh, we would have liked to had an opportunity to see more equipment, test more equipment, but we didn't. Uh, we're perfectly satisfied with the piece of equipment that's there, and and it in fact uh, has been tested on our um, our mains and found um, found at least one big leak, right? Yeah, yeah. That we couldn't find because of the stream noise. It was one of the Schooner Creek leaks. <coughs> Leave. You can do this or no. I. It was Schooner Creek. Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we couldn't find it because of uh, the noise of, of Schooner Creek. This equipment um, does a lot more than, than the current equipment we have. Um, the only issue is going to be how much time we can put into using it. And that's going to be a function of how many leaks we find, how many breaks there are. Um, in recent months, uh, they've been pretty overwhelmed by leaks that they know, know of and problems that they knew of. Um, but hopefully we'll get a break, break in that and be able to find some of the leaks. The water loss isn't getting any better. We found huge leaks on Schooner Creek, Maine, fixed those, found a, a, a number of other leaks. The numbers aren't getting any better. So it's it's we're going to try to put as much resources as we can once we get this equipment into finding some of the bigger ones. Uh, I was just going to say, when I spoke to the city of Albany, um, what he had told me was he, after they had it barely two years, they had found 60 leaks just with that equipment. That's not to mention the contractors breaking lines or just visible leaks. That's just with that equipment. And he said most of those he found, he would not have found otherwise. Let me just remind council that the reason this is even on the docket is during budget time and prior to um, a lot of discussion about water leaks and you know looking for a way when we were looking for the future to conserve water and we talked about increases in water rates and to help uh, with the conservation incentive uh, we felt as a group to uh, we needed to give the water uh, department more technology to to find existing leaks so we actually supplemented the budget um, in order to you know, provide this kind of uh, availability of higher tech so that's why it's coming before us um, did you have any uh, concern about um, not necessarily the equipment but the support of that equipment you know if the companies behind the equipment are kind of uh, hard to find um, well previously the the company that I was going through United Pipe they are no longer exist um, but I spoke with a previous employee that now is with um, Ferguson um, he says they will be picking up the fluid conservation fine huh? yeah okay you have reason to believe that you'll get adequate support yeah, well I have the direct line uh, from the vendor himself the behind that okay I spoke okay. with him in length so I assume we'll be keeping the equipment for numerous years and would like yeah, to well, make sure. well we can add to it if we need to Good. um and it, if there's other pieces and parts to it that will go along with like AMR and AMI systems, which goes along with our census meters. So if we ever went to radio read or anything like that, 
there's it's compatible. There are p p components that are compatible. Terrific. Yes. You all right? So you feel fine about them being available for consulting and maintenance? They'll yes. be there for us. Yes. Mr. Mayor. I, I also have a question to Mr. Hawker on uh, Lila's memo. We need not award the bid, not award to the low bidder. Is that because it's under fifty thousand or a hundred thousand? Is there some? Yeah, that's right. Um, when, when we purchase equipment, um, we can consider a variety of factors. Uh, we brought you the the excavator here a couple months ago. It was the low bid, but I explained at that time also that we didn't need to. Um, we could consider parts availability, uh, performance, uh, which we did, service, warranty, all kinds of different things. And it's only required that we get the bids, um, and I don't remember the, the, the dollar limit, but it's, it's, well under, um, it's well over this amount. I'm also looking at the memo, and FCS, the memo indicates we've got a bid of $36,900. And yet I look at the quote from FCS and it says 44.6. Did you get a better deal? Well, there's there's two different quotes. One is through FCS through United. I, I eliminated United and I'm looking at the FCS quote. Mr. Mayor? Who's it? Mr. Mayor, yet. The, the reason that those figures are different, based on what I can see, is that there are two classes that are added over and above the 36,000. That was going to be my question, is uh, are we going to be uh, undertaking those classes? There's a four-day class and yes. a two-day class. Yes, we are. Then, that, then the actual bid then should be 44,000 rather than 36, correct? Correct. Okay. That, that's probably what you were, 40, an even 44,000? 446. 446. According to, the, according to the quote from FCS, now memo says 36.9. Okay. Are you are you following this, Mr. Hawker? I sure am. Um, Wait, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Also in the memorandum it says here that the uh, fluid conservation system agreed to supply the product and training at the same price as United Pipe and Supply submitted to us at 36900 That's right. In the memo. So maybe there was a... Uh, maybe there was a... There may be something that was added that I that shouldn't be on there also. There was a cl class and there might be something else on one of those. I've looked at so many of these. Yeah. Well, I, we just want to make sure we're approving the right, right amount of right money. So. Um, I would think that what we could do is approve um, the purchase of this equipment, um, <coughs> and that's kind of the range of... You yeah, would give and, I'll, range. and I'll get back with you. I'm looking at the, at the uh, United Pipe Supply quote, which included training, and my understanding is that your new vendor would step into that bid. Correct. So then the price is 36. Well, it's should we wait until we find out? What well, why don't we approve with a range and sure. you know, allow... But just not to exceed. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I'll, I'll get a report back to you as to what this confusion is about. Would, would that be acceptable? To sure. Cool. Any other questions about the equipment or... Okay. Hey, th thanks for uh, fixing that one big leak. Up on Schooner Creek. Oh, that you're was welcome. a yeah. big yeah. thing to get taken care of. Good thing. Good thing to get taken care of. Thank, Thank you. you. Why don't we then uh, make a, a, entertain a motion to approve a um, purchase of the equipment? Let's see. Approve the purchase of the AC digital. What is it called? Correlator. Uh, from fluid conservation systems in the amount not to exceed 44.6. So moved. Second it. We have a uh, motion with a second. Any discussion or any? You're all right. Um, this needs to be a voice vote. And that would include the 
the uh, detection class, leak detection class? If it needs to to be up to the 44.6, it's the bid is a would be a range of 36.9 <coughs> to 44.6, and it feels like the 44.6 includes the classes. Uh, Sprague. Yes. Quant. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Ward. Yes. Eggleton. Yes. Ellingson. Yes. And Narikas. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, David, for bringing that. Good hunting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, department committee reports. Now it looks like we have a item called uh, Parks Board Dog Parks. I've heard this topic earlier this evening. Please come. Hello. I um, wrote you a memo that um, forwarded a recommendation from the Parks Board. They had uh, Cheryl Johnson come to talk to the board um, earlier. Well, I guess it was in, in late uh, March, and uh, they agreed that this was an idea worth investigating and moved unanimously to ask the council to look into uh, the uh, money and the possible locations uh, for establishing a dog park for the public good. I, with uh, the help of Kate Daschle, who has been a, a big dog park advocate for a long time, uh, put together some preliminary information for you based on uh, that collected by um, Kurt Olson and, and Richard Townsend and uh, uh, various people on the staff and in the community. So um, we have not uh, gotten into it very deeply at this point, but I know that uh, some of you are, are very interested and clearly a lot of the community members are too. So if you have any specific questions, uh, I will try to answer them or maybe Cheryl can. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Um, do you have any specific locations in mind? Well, um, we looked at a couple places last week that were on city property. Um, well, one was on city property. One was uh, um, at the old Taft Elementary School. And I'm, I'm not sure that either one would work. One was uh, close to Kurtz's Park. Um, it looked from our aerial photo like there might be a, a spot adjoining the um, the um, ball diamonds, but it turned out that it, that's actually being used for parking lot. So I don't know that we can wrestle that away. Um, and, and then it gets pretty steep out there. Um, oh, thank you. So um, the, um, the Taft Elementary School has uh, an area that's chain linked that is um, has a playground in it right now. I don't know whether it's been used or whether it's available to the public, um, but it looked like a nice a nice starter park. Uh, have not talked to the school district about it, and uh, I understand that there are there's some interest in a couple private properties, um, but they are not um, the owners are not at the at the point where we would want to discuss where those locations might be uh, because we don't know if they're interested. So um, so it's very preliminary at this, at this point. With a little bit of experience with dog parks uh, in Seattle, they are very successful. And uh, I, I really would, uh, would like to see that take place. Other questions from counselors? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Uh, did, and I know you've probably thought of this, but I heard a little bit about this a while ago um, with the um, possibility of maybe a private owner having ground where a dog park could be located, you know, so we could go into a, pro a partnership with someone that already owns the ground. Well, that would be great because the, the um, cost that uh, we included in the memo did not include land cost of course and uh, that would be a big item um, so could we could we like put a um, 
notification out of some sort to see if anybody's out there that might Would like be to interested have a dog park in that. Yeah, on their property. Like ho hosting a dog park on some land that they own somewhere in the city or something, if if it's appropriately located. Well, we can certainly investigate that if the council would like us to do that. I don't know how realistic it is, but I was just that that's kind of how I heard this story initially or this this thought process. So I didn't know if that had been tried and and found not to not to be a possibility. That's Deborah, I, I guess I, I was impressed uh, with the number of uh, 696 signatures on a petition, um, though I'm uh, enough of a skeptic to understand that it's pretty easy to put your name on a petition. So, you know, I guess my questions, and I, I was very uh, comforting before I get to my question, hearing Cheryl Johnson talk, because um, uh, my questions kind of went to expectations of city um, what really is the expectations because um, we as a council have heard very similar you know remove the name dog park and put in any other uh, I think we heard one in urban renewal a kids park um, and there's community centers or cultural centers or all sorts of wish lists so I, I would be looking at one um, though it's a great idea of skin in the game um, and I, I would encourage the existing group to uh, organize and I, I think Ms. Johnson talked about a Facebook page or you know now I'm out of my league because I don't even know what that means but um, a way to communicate so I guess I would um, be encouraged of having 696 friends uh, of a Lincoln City dog park talking to each other um, with a small uh, group who's called leadership and could tell me they've got a nonprofit organized and in place. They've got volunteers, you know, ready to take on fundraising for quarterly bark and garbage and water bills. And that all we need from the city is X, you know, and perhaps as Councilor Ellingson has talked about, uh, maybe. Uh, a lease from a private entity who's willing to, you know, lease their property or, um, you know, but we, to me, I'd need a little more refining because um, I, I like Councillor Sprague. Am a huge fan of dogs and dog parks, and think it is a would be a good amenity, um, but I'm not quite willing to put the public dollars on the table until I see skin in the game. Okay. If that makes any kind of sense. Yes, it does. And it, I think, uh, to me, hearing the mayor say that is just uh, leveraging the most we can for what we end up spending, you know, to get the most we can for it. Which sounds like you're trying to do that already, sir. Well, and I, I think it's it's a good opportunity this evening to raise public awareness about dog parks and uh, the desire and need for one here. Uh, we do have a couple um, groups that are contemplating getting uh, getting into the business of, of getting support and donations for dog parks, and um, I mentioned them in the memo. The Ford uh, Institute. Uh, is looking for a project, and I guess uh, dog park has been mentioned by several people, so that's possibly uh, one vehicle. And uh, the Beach Bark Group uh, is considering expanding their mission to include uh, raising some funds for dog park. So uh, that would be a great start for us. It would, and and that would meet you know huge um, hurdles for me, along with you know the. Talking, being able to talk tele, uh, with telecommunication or whatever it is with these 696 uh, members mm -hmm. to the dog park would mm -hmm. be terrific. Um, and, it, you know, I think certainly indicate and show uh, the support on a local basis. 
Okay, then with um, council's permission, staff will just continue to support um, the public efforts. Yeah, let me make sure. I, are there any objections? Um, uh, so far, it's not costing you anything. So I, I've uh, just got one comment. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. When we decide, if you decide on a location, things like this, make sure everybody in the surrounding area approves of it. Because when you take something like this and put it into a neighborhood, you will probably not have everyone that's really fully behind you. So please make sure that we select a location. It doesn't adequately disturb other neighbors because you can have increased flow of traffic, probably more noise and things like this in a neighborhood and things like this. And I can guarantee you'll find somebody in some neighborhood that's not going to like it. I just want to play devil's advocate in the beginning. No problems besides that. I think we have stuff near the counselor's house that, you know, to, <laughs> yeah. to eliminate. You know. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know it's nice. Something like where you live, too. Okay. Well, we will be checking our zoning right. and uh, make sure that uh, we're not in any trouble there. And uh, I understand uh, Kate talked to uh, somebody in the Parks Department in Newport, and uh, they have had uh, great success and very little uh, uh, I guess you know problems with with neighbors. It's it's been working very well for them. Yeah. So, well, I, I, again, try to emulate that. Yeah, hearing the uh, comments from Shell Johnson earlier, um, I think she hit the nail on the head with you know, as far as identifying needs and the benefits and all this stuff. You uh, has done an excellent job of uh, refining it, and uh, I see no disagreement from council. The next steps need to now progress, and I, for me anyway, it's sincere of you know ec- knowing early the expectations of city, um, and I think there is a role for the city, but it it may um, not be you know entire fitting of the bill, uh-huh. putting of the bill, um, councilor. Mr. Mayor, uh, one of the things that we did with uh, the uh, oh god, no, I got a mind blank here. Uh, with the open space was that we found people who had property who wanted to dispose of it and uh, it was really uh, to their benefit to dispose of it by reducing the the cost of that by a a substantial amount and then writing off the difference as a donation uh, saved a lot on taxes and that sort of thing and and that kind of program could go very well along with what um, uh, Gary Ellingson was talking about Right, agreed any other about uh, dog parks? And I love the marrying up, quite frankly, with um, existing, you know, the uh, beach park organization and their mission. I, I see a good fit, you know, uh, with them and the uh, potential dog. I parks. noticed Kip is here tonight, so I don't. I, you know, I noticed him back there. Yeah, we really, we don't term. really want to bring him forward, though. So, no. you know. <laughs> 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 Any other other questions? Uh, are, are you comfortable with getting back to the folks? And um, I know they're in the room, so and they can hear very well. I, I'm hoping they're hearing support, but need to do and continue the legwork. Uh, yes. Okay. Sound good. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for bringing it forward. We now have uh, an update on the community center. Thank you again for all who's in the room that came to support the idea of the dog parks. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Gail Kimberling with the Lincoln City Community Center. Just here to give you a little update on what we've been up to at the community center. Are you doing a PowerPoint? Mm. While we're waiting, I should say my dog, Gracie, says woof in support of the dog park. Are you one of these 900 or uh, 696 signatures? Uh, Not yet, but I will be. We have a petition at the community center. What we do find annually when they they shut down the pool and uh, open it up for a day for dogs... Um, just before it's, it's emptied and clean, scrubbed down, and so on. It, it, you mentioned what happens there. Uh, we have a dog swim. The day before we empty the pool for its annual uh, scrubbing and cleaning, 
we lower the water about halfway and we invite customers to bring their dogs. They donate um, a couple cans of food for the local food pantry and we get anywhere from 50 to 100 dogs and um, amazingly they're well behaved. I think when they're off leash and it's not their own turf they know they have to get along well together and it's a hoot if you ever want to be entertained. It's always on Labor Day. So, so this is the uh, Lincoln City Community Center um, update for spring 2012. Um, we started off the month of March. We had the fourth annual Lincoln City Half Marathon and 10K, and I'm happy to report this event just keeps growing and getting bigger every year. Um, this year, our race participants came mainly from um, Oregon and outside of Lincoln County. 72% came from around the state. We had 18% from Lincoln County. Um, quite a number from Washington State, and then a few from Idaho, California, Nevada, and one from back east this year. Of those um, participants, and there were over 400 and some registered, 275 were involved in the half marathon, and 154 were in the 10K. So a lot of overachievers in this bunch. Mm -hmm. Um, we had runners and walkers of all shapes, sizes, and speeds. We had our first hand cyclist entered this year. He started a few minutes before everybody else, and um, he said his goal was to beat the first runner finisher, and he did by about a minute. And then we had a local young man, Jason Zacker, who started at the back of the pack, and he took pledges for every person he passed on the race, and he on the way raised $3,000 for Angels Anonymous. So I think he passed everyone but six runners. It was a pretty remarkable feat. Then of course we had a little snow in March. Um, and you see a little flower on the side. I was in Hawaii. I missed all the fun. <laughs> but my staff did a great job, um, communicated with City Hall, kept the doors open, the generators were running. We had a little bit of power fluctuations which affected our spa pump motor. So it was down for about two weeks, um, but it's all been repaired. Everything was good to go by the time it was spring break. Um, spring break, of course, was the last week, March 24th through April 1st, and our, fools, our pools were filled to capacity. There were a couple times during the week where we had to tell people we can't let any more in until um, some people come. Oops, come out. Sorry, pointer. And um, all the customers were real understanding. They would go play in the gym, wait their turn. And if you've ever been in a pool, it's always kind of a continuous turnover anyway. So everyone got their turn to swim. We were fully staffed with lifeguards. Um, we had at times five or six lifeguards on deck. Um, no close calls. Everything went really smoothly. Sometimes we had to bring in other staff to help. In the lower left-hand corner, you'll see Carl McShane, who's our recreation supervisor, and, of course, trained in first aid and CPR. He ran the water slide for us at one point. Uh, the community center was enjoyed by 1,400 youths during spring break. Um, it was just a great week for us. And If they weren't in the pool, they were climbing the rock wall, they were in the gym. Um, 200 climbers climbed the wall during that week. Um, this is our revenue. Um, you can see in 2012 this year we um, reached a high point. Of course, the weather didn't hurt at all. Um, I did my rain dance. My staff told me that the next time I should leave out the twirls so it's not quite so windy during spring break. Um, this little bump you see on Thursday of this spring break was when we experienced a power outage in half of the town. And I know the movie theaters were out um, in taps, so we had a lot of customers come who couldn't go to the movies that day. Um, so overall, we were very pleased with um, the customers that we have, with the way everything operated. Staff was terrific, patient. Um, it just worked out very well. We were proud to open our doors to all our visitors and residents. Um, also in March, we have our annual March Madness program, and this is a little event where we invite people who use the community centers, um, they don't have to be members, to chart how much they exercise on a wall chart. We had 30 participants this year. 
um, who put in a total of 501 hours of exercise just during the month of March. We have a male and a female winner, Carlene Robinson, put in 40 hours, and Frank King, who's 89 years young, put in 33 hours, and most of his are in the pool. Um, We've decided we all want to be like Frank when we're that age. He's pretty amazing. So it's just a little friendly competition to kind of encourage you to keep going to exercise when the weather's not quite so good yet, when your January New Year's resolutions are way past. Um, So we try to do this every March, and it's real successful. Um, This is something you might be interested in because we did, our rates did go up as of March 1st um, following passage by the council. Um, These two um, compare new and renewals for memberships from 2011 to 2012. You can tell we're overall up um, in 2012 We were up both in January and February over last year. We did take a little dip in March. I don't know if that's because a lot of people renewed their memberships in February before the rate increase. Um, So we'll certainly track the trend for the next few months and the rest of this year to see, you know, how it continues. Um, But the good news is we're still up considerably over last year. Coming next, we have the Lincoln City Swim Club Spring Invitational, um, April 27th through the 29th. And we expect 300 swimmers to be in our pool. And, of course, they bring along their coaches, parents, siblings, and um, cheerleaders. So you can expect the town to be probably near capacity that weekend. It's always a very busy weekend. They take over the swimming pool in our meeting rooms. However, the fitness areas and the gymnasium and the rock wall remain open to the public at that time. We're also introducing adult co-ed volleyball or dodgeball, and I have some uh, information forms in case any council members are interested in this new league. Um, We have teams forming now. We anticipate six to eight teams of eight to ten players. They'll be playing games at 6 p.m. on Friday nights beginning April 20th in the community center gym. Um, This started out as a petition on the counter at the community center, and within just a couple of weeks we probably had four single-spaced pages of names signed up that they were interested in this. Um, And quite a few people have come forward. We had a meeting last week with about a dozen interested team captains, and I think it just promises to be a lot of fun. The balls are softer than the ones you used in uh, grade school, so the risk of injury is low. There are rules you have to follow, um, so we just hope it's going to be a a good time for everyone. And if you're interested, Carl McShane, our new recreation supervisor, is the one who's putting this league together. And our biggest news is we now have online registration available to the public. It just went live on Sunday, and you can find this by going to activenet.active.com slash LCCC. And we will be doing, of course, lots of press releases, radio announcements, getting the word out um, to the public about this um, this new program and we're just so excited because you can not only sign up for swim lessons you can sign up for the rec kids after school program for the summer program you can renew your membership purchase new memberships online and you can reserve um, any of our facilities including the park facilities by going online to this website Um, our administrative coordinator Kate McClellan has just done the lion's share of the work in getting this ready to go live to the public so I want to extend my kudos to her and to the entire community center staff who've um, done a great job of getting all of our information uploaded we have done um, test and retest and more tests to make sure that it should all work really well for the public and we should get a link on our, our website right we will also put a link on the Lincoln City Commun- uh, Lincoln City website as well. Yes, so if you get a chance, check it out. Um, it's pretty entertaining. We have lots of photos, lots of information for everyone on there. And that's my presentation. Any questions? Council, any uh, any questions for Gail? Yes, Gail, how many dogs do we have participating in that uh, swim event? 
in 2011, I believe we had close to 80 dogs. And regarding lockers, we had a complaint a number of months ago regarding lockers. We are still trying to resolve that. We've gone out and searched several different vendors trying to find um, a source for keys, which has been the main problem. They come from Germany. We haven't been able to receive any, even through different vendors. We did find some old keys that we were able to retrofit and make work in some of the lockers, and we may also take some keys from the lockers that are on the deck and use those inside the locker rooms instead. So that will help bring up the number that are available for daily rent, but we're still in the midst of searching for a permanent solution. And I believe there was also a question regarding passes and somehow the pass is not being compatible with software? That's all been resolved. Um, with okay. this new ActiveNet program, um, knock on wood, we are 99.9% .9 up and running with that. Great. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And I guess staying with that, weren't there, were there drain issues or water issues or Those have all been cold? Those have all been resolved as Knowing well. that we can't please everybody all the time. We but, try. Uh, and, and, of course, there's still fluctuations. With technology running our heating program for both the atmosphere and the pool, there are some glitches, but we, um, I think, are doing a pretty good job of maintaining constant temperatures. You know, not, not to belabor, but not to let it go. Um, my understanding on the locks and the lockers, it's for the general public when they come in, without yes. a, you know, they haven't purchased a locker for long term or something. Right. So it's they for need, the day use. So daily use. So they need some kind of place to leave their belongings. Right. A absent locks, and um, I, it's been quite a while that we've heard about this and not to have found the solution yet. What is our solution currently? How are we handling people that need someplace, a secure place for their valuables? We have not found that we run out of lockers. Um, okay. Even during the busiest times during spring break, a family member would hold the valuables. Um, we didn't hear once that there's no lockers available. Um, they might not be the size, since there's two sizes, a small and a large one that you would prefer, but um, we haven't heard that no one has been able to actually find one. So the, the noise then may be from our local residents who are maybe used to a favorite locker or something? That exactly, yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. Because um, I, I would think we'd, we'd certainly want to and need to do whatever we can to make sure there's a secure place. Oh, you um, Right. To, and we to remind people, when they come to the front counter, we try to remind them, you know, be sure to lock your valuables. Unfortunately, we have had some thefts, and I think it's just, you know, the way the world is right now. So we try to remind people to lock everything up. Any other other questions, uh, from Council? All right. No one wants a dodgeball flyer. No. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, we have another update on the pedestrian bicycle plan. Deborah, welcome back. Are you doing a PowerPoint also? Yes, I am. Okay. I might uh, point out to the audience and to the both in the chambers and on uh, cable that our two counselors the far end aren't just watching TV they <coughs> because we've got them buried uh, they're not able to see the screen quite as well and so they now have a monitor uh, we've limited the channels that they can watch. <laughs> and, uh, it is just the screen that they can see. No, I, I prescribed to Netflix. Just getting Alex talked into bringing it on. Right. And, uh, Thank you, Deborah. Okay, um, I'd like to tell you uh, specifically about the Project Advisory Committee meeting we had last Wednesday. Uh, this is the third meeting of this group. And uh, the advisory group uh, helps us um, with direction in proceeding with this project. Uh, the first two meetings were about setting uh, goals and objectives and identifying uh, existing needs and deficiencies. Uh, for this meeting, we talked about uh, possible solutions that would work in Lincoln City. 
So I'm just going to run through rather quickly. I did give you a link to the um, the a memo number three, so uh, you have that to refer to or go back to later on. Um, the treatments that were proposed all had in mind these guiding principles. I don't think there's anything very controversial there. Um, safety, accessibility, connection. Um, and um, we also were cautioned that uh, when we implement, we have to look at specifics about uh, the location and be flexible and use professional judgment in applying these treatments. Um, the consultants pointed out to us or reminded us that uh, we are trying to serve um, the whole population from zero um, to um, the elderly and that we all have different needs at different points in our lives. Even if we physically are able, uh, have no disabilities, we may be caring for uh, children or elderly who do, um, or we have um, a stroller to push or a dog to, to take with us or three children who want to hang onto our hands. So when we keep in mind um, or when we think about sidewalks and bikeways, we have to, we have to be mindful of that. They gave us very specific details on the needs for bicyclists and also the different types of bicycles and accessories that, uh, that we need to plan for and the different types of bicyclists. Uh, 33, almost a third, third of our population is not interested in bicycling. But 60% are, uh, they have concerns and are a little bit timid about mixing it up with, um, with the cars. Uh, we have a few uh, percentage uh, uh, who are more confident and 1% who, who are strong and fearless. So, um, but we want to reach the, the larger number, of course. So um, I'll just buzz through uh, some of the uh, proposed treatments, and if you want to talk more about them, let me know. Uh, the obvious one is sidewalks, and, of course, um, the uh, one of the questions that came up at the meeting is, do they all have to be paved? Can they be something else that's less expensive? Uh, crushed fines is um, is a treatment then that it, it's like a fine gravel that I understand does comply with ADA standards. So we may be looking at something like that instead of concrete in every situation. But the ideal, of course, is to have. Um, have the pedestrian zone and in some of our neighborhoods um, where it's uh, residential neighborhoods uh, maybe that's all we have but in uh, uh, the more uh, downtown or pearl areas we may need to have a furnishing zone where we can put our light poles and um, if we have planters our planters benches that kind of thing so that we can keep a clear path for pedestrians um, and in addition to that in front of the stores we might want to have a, um, a frontage zone so that the store owners have a place for some of their items bike lanes um, the ideal is to have a separate space for each uh, type of travel um, in some cases, we don't have room for that, so we have to figure out other ways to accommodate everyone. Holmes Road is an example uh, that they used and showed uh, bike lanes along both sides of the street there, uh, which raised the question, would we ever consider a solution that included bike lanes but not sidewalks? And uh, the group seemed to think that, um, and I agree that uh, Holmes Road has um, a lot of pedestrians. I see a few bicycles there. I travel there almost every day on my way home from work. Um, but I, and I always see pedestrians. And so um, we ask them to um, consider having bicycle, uh, uh, sidewalks. Um, and what we're seeing here is uh, shared lane marking. So in this case, the uh, extra right-of-way is dedicated to sidewalks, and it may be we'd want to have a wider sidewalk on one side like the Head to Bay Trail, or we might want to divide it up into six, five or six-foot sidewalks on each side. Uh, the shared lane marking is this bicycle uh, that is printed on the travel lane 
so it gives the drivers a heads up that they can expect to share the lane with bikes and it also points the bikes where they should properly travel in the lane another possible use of shared lane markings might be coast avenue that's one of our narrow streets fairly busy and i had to scribble on this you can tell what i did and what the consultants did i think without too much differentiation here but everybody said again you know where's the sidewalk we have our mike trusted or from alta is a real bike advocate so we have to keep reminding him that that our priority is is pedestrians as well so so given that we would have either fines or we would have sidewalk or something along here in the shared use markings are demonstrated on the street we have the concept of shared use pathway shared use pathways and that is typified by the head to bay trail but in of course the case of the head to bay trail we have aligned it adjacent to street and they advise that we be careful on how we do that because we don't want at intersections for traffic to have to consider both what's going on in the street and what's going on in the adjoining or the nearby path so we had a cautionary note on that one but there is a good application that's shown later in the slide show they had to be trail their type well obviously we want to fill in the gaps so that's kind of a no brainer and we're we'll continue to look for money to do that the other gap that's notable here is in the wetlands this is on West Devils Lake Road just south of the hospital that will require a boardwalk so that we do not interfere with the function of the wetlands lots of traffic calming ideas out there and we talked a little bit about each one we talked about traffic lumps as opposed to traffic humps right now we have a traffic hump on jetty it's a solid raised area that crosses the travel lanes the the lump instead of the hump has lowered areas so that emergency vehicles can go through without going over the hump and so can bicycles neck downs that would temper that would narrow the street in some areas so that it would slow traffic curb extensions we have those in Ocean Lake but I'll show a slide later on that shows that we could improve on that because they don't really extend out far enough that pedestrians can see around parked cars and cars cannot see the pedestrians waiting there to cross other ideas are raised crosswalks so it kind of combines the 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 designated crosswalk with a hump chicanes are places in the street that again narrow the width of the street so it causes cars to slow down and medians that shift the direction many traffic circles we have one that comes to mind immediately in IGA South near there it's off the street so it's but it functions the same way here's a here's an image that sort of represents this and again I had to draw in the sidewalks because of course several people at the meeting said where are the sidewalks where are the pedestrians supposed to go so this one is showing the the turnarounds turnabouts and those would be at intersections the hump here is shown some of our members have been pedestrian advocates for quite a long time and because I think in part their neighborhoods are include streets where people come off the highway and they see the ocean down the hill in front of them and they they kind of you know pick up a lot of speed just in a hurry to get there and it is disruptive to the neighborhood and it feels uncomfortable to pedestrians if it isn't actually dangerous 
an idea that uh, had some support at the meeting was uh, one-way street couplets. Where we have really narrow streets, uh, there's uh, possibly an opportunity uh, where two of them are uh, 300 feet apart, as our blocks are about that width, um, to have um, cars going east on one street and going west on the other street. Uh, by doing that, you reduce the need for two travel lanes to, uh, for, to one motor vehicle lane and allows uh, us to put in bikeways, sidewalks, um, and still maintain the parking. Um, I've put peas on the cars that are parked so that you can tell the difference in this, in this uh, diagram here. And one example would be Southwest Fleet. This is uh, just south uh, west of the city hall. And uh, this narrow road winds down to 11th Southwest that goes down to the uh, Canyon Park. And uh, you've probably all been through here in the summertime when it's full of um, kids and, and tourists and dogs and on leashes and, and cars. So um, we see an opportunity possibly there. Uh, shared streets is um, an idea that um, has been popular in Europe, and they're trying at various places here in the United States. Uh, it recognizes that sometimes we just all have to share the existing space. And um, this is the existing situation where there's no distinct designation. Um, in this case, different materials are used, and um, there's some areas of planting to show that this is not travel uh, for motor vehicles, that this is for parking, this is, and uh, the, the pedestrians and, and uh, cars then have to recognize each other's presence and, um, and move accordingly. In this case, they've also thrown in a little chicane, which would be a traffic calming feature to make sure that the um, cars uh, don't exceed a, a safe speed for sharing. Uh, they've used an example of Northwest 25th. Um, this is IGA and the um, Congregational Church are here. Um, and as you move, and, and it extends close to the ocean uh, to the west. I threw in this, uh, this is a slide I, I added because I wanted to show you this sign. This is a share the, share the street sign uh, used in, in Germany, but uh, I think it really conveys the message. Uh, you, can, you can achieve a similar effect by marking the pavement with the bicycle and a pedestrian, um, but I think this adds a lot in terms of people's recognition of, of what the street is intended uh, to do. This is uh, an example from the consultants uh, from California. It just uh, was constructed. And you can see that people are parking. Um, unfortunately, there aren't any people actually using the street, so we don't get the full effect. But the uh, intersection area shows a strong distinction that this is a different type of a street than maybe the arterial that they were or the collector that they were traveling on before. And this demonstrates that, that uh, use of this type of a shared street approach would be for a short street. It wouldn't be for a, a major collector or thoroughfare. Um, so a limited application, but uh, given the existing streets we have that are so narrow uh, and do pose some safety issues because of uh, the hills and uh, curves, uh, this might be uh, an approach that comes into play here. Uh, on 101, of course, we have a different situation because we're working with ODOT, but I have to say that um, our um, liaison with ODOT is very helpful in this regard, and um, we found that um, we have lots of good ideas um, coming from ODOT and supported by ODOT. Here again, it's a sort of the same thing, um, but in this case where we're, we're looking at the street, it's actually the highway, so uh, we have different types of traffic and, and a lot more traffic than on our local streets. 
um, the gap um, was depicted here as going from um, no sidewalk and no bike lanes to sidewalk and bike lanes on both sides. And actually, uh, that uh, meeting that we had last week uh, that um, Kurt was talking about, um, this is a cross-section from a t sort of a typical cross-section. And you can see that they are doing exactly that. They are planning for sidewalks on both sides and uh, bike lanes. So that's, uh, we're, we're really pleased to see that. In some cases, there's enough uh, space for some separation, a planting strip of some sort that uh, gives us more separation and maybe opportunity for stormwater treatment. Uh, where we don't have enough room for separated bikeways, we will talk, uh, can discuss shoulder bikeways. And um, that might be uh, in the Cutler City area to Schooner Creek Bridge. So in this case, we've got the sidewalk on one side and a wider shoulder on the other side for the bikes. Here's the shared youth path, use path. I'm having trouble with that. Um, and this is where you know a concern might be about intersections and how cars turning will be paying attention to the oncoming cars and hopefully they can also keep an eye on the bicycles and the bicycles will be keeping an eye on the cars. Um, they mentioned that a good example of where this might be appropriate is north as we go north of town, very few intersections um, as we're leaving uh, Lincoln City. And so you could have this this path um, that would accommodate both pedestrians and bicycles and two-way traffic. Uh, road diet is a topic that we discussed and uh, gained some support from committee members. Uh, the question posed to them was whether or not um, we should continue to look at road diet as a possible solution. We are also working on a master plan, and there, um, that is being paid for by ODOT, uh, and that process is just starting up. Um, we do have money in that budget to do some modeling to see exactly what the impact of a road diet would be, uh, say, in Ocean Lake or in Dee River. And um, what... We are having our pedestrian bike advocates do a white paper that talks about the experience other communities have had with road diets, uh, the benefits and uh, any um, disadvantages there might be, and how they would be similar or dissimilar to Lincoln City situations. So um, essentially what we're talking about with the road diet is that we have a four-lane Highway. We have parking on both sides. Um, what would be the benefits of making a turn lane? And then what could we get by with two um, through lanes? And then be able to accommodate, because you have an extra 12 feet, uh, bike lanes or uh, expanded, widened sidewalks. Um, uh, something of that on that order and still maintain your parking on both sides. So uh, maybe the turn lane is enough of an advantage that it offsets that, um, you know, that, that one lane less. So there was, uh, there was interest in that. And um, we will uh, be looking forward to the white paper and also uh, ask our uh, master plan consultants to do modeling to see uh, see where that goes. And here is the depiction of what that would look like in Ocean Lake. Now there's nobody parked here, but the, there is this does allow for the parking on both sides, bike lanes, the two through lanes, and the turn lane. All right, shared lane markings also work on the highway, and ODOT is willing to consider those uh, in areas where we uh, don't have room for uh, everything we need. In some cases, we only have three lanes now. Um, in some cases, we only have two lanes now. But um, where, we, where we don't have enough room for separated bike lanes, this is an option, and um, we are getting support from our 
uh, PAC members for that and also hearing that ODOT is happy to consider that for us. Enhanced crosswalks would be uh, wonderful. Um, we have concerns from even the most careful drivers that they are not going to see the pedestrian waiting to cross. Um, and there are um, things called pedestrian hybrid beacons. They are overhead. Um, I saw those in uh, Salem. I didn't like those as much as the ones that were at pedestrian level because I found myself looking up at the light and then also needing to look down for the pedestrians and uh, I don't want to be looking at the wrong place at the wrong time but um, these are uh, another type of beacon um, rectangular rapid flash beacons they're just under the uh, bike and ped crossing symbol and they actually flash when they are activated by a pedestrian so that would be a very attention getting. And then there are structural things you can do in the middle of the street to um, enhance the, um, the crosswalk where you do have that third turn lane. Um, if there isn't an intersection, if you're talking about a mid-cross, mid-block crossing, uh, you can provide sort of a safe haven for somebody coming across the street. They only have to look at cars coming from one direction at one time. Uh, shortening the distance um, for crossing and also getting the pedestrians out there where they can seen, be seen before they step into the um, oncoming traffic um, is um, the use of um, is, is the reason for using curb extensions. Um, I, I added a little bit here because I didn't think they had the perspective quite right, but uh, the idea is that we need to bump these out a little bit further. Um, ODOT's uh, paying attention to that and going to see what they can do in this regard because this would be their project and uh, would make a big difference, I think. Uh, also, um, they have shown an enhanced crosswalk at 39th and show uh, this uh, rapid flashing beacon, uh, the white lines, markings, which of course they always have to be maintained, and um, and again, a, a safe haven for pedestrians as they cross. And the ramp. We had a lot of um, um, concern in, in some areas here and also at Logan that um, the sidewalks kind of stopped and there wasn't a way to continue on. So we want to make sure we take care of those things. Uh, ODOT is willing to look at um, things that we might be able to do in terms of maintenance such as markings. Um, stripings that uh, won't cost a lot of money or time to implement. So we're hoping to get some of those things started in advance of uh, the more expensive items. Uh, again, I, I think I've already addressed the furnishing zone. When we have space on our sidewalks, it's nice to be able to separate uh, these kinds of amenities for pedestrians and bikes and shoppers from the um, necessary width for uh, pedestrians. And here is uh, an example where they have photoshopped this um, area and added a little more sidewalk width. So that's another option that we can um, offer up if we, if we are able to do uh, a road diet or something that, that ends up offering us some, some more space to play with. So that is, in a nutshell, what we talked about last Wednesday. Our um, Next meeting will be sometime in May with the advisory committee, and we will be talking about a system approach. And so, um, what kind of treatments we're going to use on different types of streets? They're not going to be able to address every street in town, but we will um, do types of streets at where these types, these treatments are appropriate. And then the following meeting in June will be interesting. It will be a discussion of how we are going to implement this plan. Um, that will include both things that we can do as far as our ordinances and our procedures uh, within the city and also financing that might be available and where we can look for that. So that is the update. And the citizen that are participating in this study staying uh, with you are 
continue to be energized or participatory? We had a couple, well, um, yeah. Uh, we were short a few members last time. There were uh, a few people who had called us and said they had conflicts, were not able to come. Um, we have to replace a couple members who have left and um, to do other things um, in other towns. And, um, but I think that the, the um, people that we did have there were engaged and we sent them, um, some of them filled out uh, an evaluation form of the treatments at the meeting. Others took it home with them and, and will be getting it back to us uh, so that we have a, a sense. We, we, we were kind of rushed. We were trying to get through all this in an hour and a half. I think uh, we had one suggestion after the meeting that we just go to two hours and, and uh, then allow ourselves more time for discussion. Um, so we are still encouraging that input even after the meeting. Um, they, they did say, um, they, they did have a lot of good comments, I think, at the meeting. And um, they also have indicated that they are willing to serve, um, and as we had asked them to, um, for the master plan as well. And the timing is going to be rather good about that because they will be completing their work for this effort in June with that June meeting. And... Um, the transportation master plan is starting up and expects to hold the first meeting of the advisory group in in the early fall. So um, we're going to keep them keep them engaged. Good. All right. We are looking. Can I, if I can mention, uh, we do want um, a representative for the Hispanic community um, to make sure that we are not running into any language barrier problems and that we are reaching. Um, all the groups and we did have <coughs> someone who worked on uh, the city staff but he's taken another job elsewhere and uh, so if um, if anybody in our listening audience is um, is interested or knows somebody who would be good for that role we would like to hear from them thank you other questions yes counselor uh, Deborah on the enhanced crosswalks slide I didn't see any option for lights in the pavement is that no longer an option I guess they're really hard to maintain and uh, that's why they kind of steered us away from that um, with the traffic constantly you know they tried to space them so that the tires go in between them but I think it's it's kind of a problem so it seems that um, these other these other treatments are more pro uh, more I, I think that technology may be developing to be more durable um, I just I, I have read some problem areas with them, um, but I don't think they're done. It's a great idea, so I mean I don't think it's over. Portland has has put some in I think fairly recently, so they must have faith in them. Yeah, Tiger has too. Okay. Yeah. Other uh, do, you, do you particularly like them, Ch um, Chester, or are you just... I think they're terribly effective. I mean, like you, I wouldn't want to be looking up to see if this light's flashing. Right. And taking my eyes off the road. Right. Or looking to the side to see if the light's flashing, to take mm -hmm. my eyes off the road. So I, I think it's, a, if, if it's feasible, I think it's a great idea. Cutler Sprague. Yes, I, actually, that was one of my questions, and uh, I'm glad you answered it. I, I would certainly hope that the technology will will support that because the places that I've seen it, it uh, it really helps in knowing that there's a pedestrian that's either walking or going to be walking, especially when they're blocked by a uh, parked vehicle. There, it's hard to see them. Uh, I've got three other questions too on Northwest Jetty. That picture that you showed, right now. Uh, there are places on Northwest Jetty where it's almost impossible to maintain the the normal speed and have two cars pass because it's so narrow. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to add sidewalks or bike trails down that that street, uh, are you going to have to acquire more right of way? No, that's that's not something we're counting on. Uh, but in a lot of cases, I'm looking for Northwest Jetty. Still haven't found it. I think that was the first picture you showed. Oh. There you are. Okay, there we go. Uh, typically, we have at least 
40 feet of right of way. And our pavement widths range from, well, you know, the smallest is probably about 16 feet. Uh, typical might be 20. Uh, so we have room there, but um, sometimes it might be a little difficult to access because people have landscaped in that area. Uh, they, uh, we may have power poles in part of that area. So, you know, it, it's going to be a case-by-case -case thing seeing what is actually <laughs> possible. Um, but at least we have we probably do have adequate right-of-way to address the, the pedestrian issue. Um, if we find that there are too many obstacles in the way, then, you know, we may look at some of these other um, options if the, if the type of street is appropriate, say, for instance, the shared markings or the shared street concept, um, where we just have to say, okay, this is what we've got to work with. And uh, so, you know, everyone has to accommodate the other users before you get to 24th uh, going northbound there's a drain there that is a big dip and when there's a car coming the other way you better stop and not go over that drain or you're going to bottom out I mean it, it, it's uh, very, quite severe then you go over the the hill dropping down to 25th and right in that area it is so narrow that you could almost lose a rearview mirror on the car coming the other way it's very very tight and they just had build a new house right there mm -hmm. which creates mm -hmm. even more danger with people backing out because that's about the only way they can do it mm -hmm. so uh, that's a that's a real uh, potential problem another question about uh, uh, the, the, sim the same question about right away is on Holmes Road with that configuration you showed is there enough there I believe Holmes Road again is, is about 40 uh, feet in width and um, what we're adding, what we're talking about adding, okay, let's look at the sidewalk one. With this, if we add, oh, in this case, we're putting the bicycles in the street with the, with the cars. It's a short, it's a short road, um, and it's relatively flat, so it seems like this might be a, a reasonable thing to do. Uh, with the sidewalk, we're talking about uh, maybe 10 feet total. For sidewalk, if we tried to put some kind of a planting strip, uh, maybe that would be four feet each. So um, you've got another 14 feet. We probably do have adequate room to do that. Um, but again, then you know the neighbors have to realize that um, that's going to, as it did with uh, West Devils Lake Road, um, if they've planted their garden out there or if they're used to parking there. Um, we might have to make some sacrifices in that in that regard. Uh, also, taking uh, 101 and reducing two lanes, which in various times of the year are just absolutely backed up for blocks, many blocks, and then taking two of those lanes away, what happens to that blockage that I'm talking about? <coughs> well, you know... Um, as we drive through Lincoln City, we go from three lanes to two lanes. I mean, four lanes, yeah. Four, and so uh, we have these bottlenecks. And uh, I, as someone, one of our committee members said, you know, if we did three lanes all the way through town, maybe that would be the best solution because then we wouldn't have this, uh, these people trying to merge all the time. Uh, and if you consistently have a turn lane that gets takes all of that kind of traffic out of the way you reduce the potential for rear end uh, accidents um, and um, and holdups as, as, as people are waiting for somebody to take that left turn um, the way it is now with the four lanes uh, may, you, you have options when you're traveling say south and somebody in front of you wants to take a left turn but that means you have to merge into the other lane which means that you know that kind of backs things up there so this is why I think the modeling that the transportation master plan will do is going to be really informative to tell us exactly how that's going to change the traffic flow and whether or not uh, we're going to see any traffic diverted to other streets so you know that kind of remains to be seen but those are good questions is that being uh, thought possible or 
included in that plan is changing uh, the Taft area then into, into two lanes instead of four. Oh, well, uh, you know, I think everybody's pretty happy with Taft right now, so I'm not going to suggest we do anything there myself. But um, um, Well, no, I'm not suggesting no. that. I'm just wondering if that was included <coughs> A suggestion when you talked about having three lanes all the way through town. I don't know if the the individual was was thinking about Taft or all those areas of town where it's it's going in and out, you know, north of Taft. So, um, I think that would be the last place we would probably want to. I think before I would be on board with three lanes all the way through town, where except for Taft. Mm -hmm that I'd want to see that other cities have gone from four lanes to two lanes or three lanes to uh, and to show that their traffic moves better. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and the white paper that uh, we expect to get from our uh, bike and pedestrian consultants uh, will do those comparisons, and they've selected some uh, recent studies. Um, and they have also selected some specific examples of their cities that are similar to uh, Lincoln City um, in terms of population or traffic or, you know, um, the type of community. And so we do have some examples to take a look at, and that will be informative. And then when we actually do the modeling, uh, we'll have a pretty good sense of, of where the traffic, uh, how the traffic will be affected. Then the last question is, this is all conceptual. Uh, we're not in a position to fund any or all of these, are we? Well, um, ODOT always is offering grants, and I think by uh, completing this plan, we are showing them that we are ready, that we um, have gotten be we, we have gotten behind a plan, we have a vision for how we are going to address the problems in the city, and uh, that puts us in a, in a good position to, to ask for funding. Um, they have a um, Safe Routes School program, and they um, also have um, um, other infrastructure programs. They handle a lot of money um, from the um, Oh, I've forgotten what it's called. The the um, there are a lot of different buckets at ODOT. Well, all, all, yeah, and a lot of the money that came through the the um, the stimulus funds um, came through ODOT as well. And so, um, if we're if it's, the more ready we are, uh, and the more we have thought in advance about what we want to do, uh, the easier it is for us to capture those funds. And do uh, most of those uh, offers of stimulus money and others, are, are those uh, met, uh, to be matched by us? Well, uh, some of them are. Uh, it all depends on the grant program. This will also help us in terms of when we collect um, SDCs for system development charges, when we get um, new houses, uh, new construction going on. It helps us figure out exactly what we want to have happen on those streets so we can say exactly uh, what kind of funds we're going to need and, and uh, apportion those accordingly. And um, it helps us with our maintenance in some cases where it's not a matter of actual construction of, of uh, or expansion of street, but just in terms of maybe how we'd stripe the street differently. Um, and, uh, of course, what's happening on the highway, uh, a lot of that will um, be ODOT in terms of striping and that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's not a big cost item for them. It's, it's just a matter of how they do their job. So we could do a lot, make a lot of improvements just by making it clear where we want the different um, types of traveler to be. So I, I think there's a lot of good that can come out of this, and um, we are... Uh, mindful of the fact that we don't have a lot of money to spend here, and we're hoping to um, make a lot of progress without. Do we have anybody from Public Works uh, on your committee? Absolutely. Yeah, the project management team includes Stephanie Reed, who's our city engineer, and Richard uh, Townsend, and um, and the rest of the planning department, and. Um, we also have on our, we had a technical advisory committee that included both uh, Stephanie and Lila, 
and Stephanie is involved, the um, um, assistant engineer and the associate engineer to some extent in this planning. And so, um, yeah, we're all working together. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Quant. Yeah, I just got one comment, speed bumps. Being the recipient of a speed bump in front of my house, I don't advise it by any houses, okay? I have one in front of my house. I, North Lincoln Sanitary goes by. Pepsi Company goes by. Cisco goes by. School buses go by. I get to feel them all. You feel them? Oh, yes, I do. Oh. Okay, this last time when they redid the overlay, I was a little too late. I wasn't a city councilor yet. They could have moved it 50 <laughs> feet further down the street where there's no houses. We would have been all right, but it was too late. But like I say, there's, you know, I do feel the buses and trucks and stuff when wow. I go by my house. Well, maybe we can interest you in a speed lump. Yeah. And <laughs> they, they, they flatten it out a little bit, but you still feel them. When they come down the street, they go over, and the house shakes. Yeah. It's a brand new house, too. It's supposed to be earthquake-proof, but <laughs> obviously. Other, other questions from council? All right. Thank you. You are welcome. For, for the update and a lot of... Uh, New words from that vocabulary of uh, around traffic and bikes and. And I'd encourage everyone to visit the website. It's LincolnCityPedBike.org. All right, thank you. <laughs> Put it in, you guys. All right, we have now city manager report. Um, really down there. Yeah. Um, I have just a couple of very very brief items. Again, it's, it's budget time, and that's where my concentration has been. Uh, but we did get a, a, a question at the la I guess it was the last meeting uh, from Councillor Ellingson about the commercial inventory. It came up in public, so I thought I'd respond. It had to do with Bymart space, the um, old Bymart space, whether it was available or not. Um, the answer is yes, it is available. Uh, so the square footage on the plan or on the inventory is correct. Oh, thank you. Okay. And then um, just to, this is a short aside, maybe following up on what Gail Kimberling uh, said, uh, I just got this uh, email from Nikki Price to Sandy Pfaff because Sandy was on, on vacation. And, th and it has to do with, with uh, spring break and the kind of things that, that people were taking advantage of. We saw community center uh, here's here's what I'm reading on on the uh, <coughs> festival of illusions that the VCB put on um, thanks so much for blah 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 this came on March 30 so it wasn't complete Wednesday night they had 136 Thursday night 194 and turned away 40 because of the capacity of the room uh, tonight's pre-sale is 170, and I assume they sold out that night. And Saturday, this was before Saturday, and then also the um, um, they also had a. Um, I'm sorry, I'm searching for the word. <laughs> they had something for kids, camps, uh, magic camps for kids. Mm -hmm. They all sold out, mm -hmm. and so that was. Uh, the more things like that there are during during rainy spring break, um, I'm guessing a lot of those people still had a good time in spite of the weather. So there is some real strategic value in advertising sunshine, but actually having rain. Absolutely, uh, and that's what we here. got. Okay, we'll work on that. That's it doesn't work as well the other way when they advertise rain and we get sun, yeah. and that's been a problem. And we've finally been able to get. Um, one of the one of the major channels in Portland to be a little more accurate on coastal forecasts. We've also been working um, with NOAA um, about their forecasts, and because we had, for example, August, um, their forecasts were cloudy, cloudy, occasional rain, um, and it was clear day after day after day. So we've been working a little bit with them trying to improve that. And that's all I had, Mayor. That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, go to the next uh, agenda item, and that is uh, public comment time. And this is uh, an opportunity to receive additional comments, public comments, regarding our proposed ordinance number 2012-05, an ordinance of the City of Lincoln City amending Municipal Code Chapter 
10.20 and ordinance number 2005-12 and regulating the licensing and operation of the taxi cab business operators and drivers and in your packets uh, in on the agenda you can see the uh, there's an ordinance further down uh, but this would be the time if there's any public uh, further public comments we had one at last meeting uh, but wanted to hold open I don't see anybody anything to add uh, so that the ordinance looked when I read it looked to be the uh, marked up one um, that we had seen before Mr. Mayor yes uh, I actually heard from uh, <coughs> a cab company uh, in the interim between these two last meetings Good. And uh, again, with some concern towards the amount of the insurance increase. Um, you gonna watch me out? Uh, yeah, right. No, it's off. I'm telling you, it's off. Yeah, I just wanted to watch you. Uh, you can just look over here. Okay. Uh, the. Uh, uh, there seems to be some uh, kind of a disconnect on, on how much uh, I'm, I'm actually really concerned about this now uh, the uh, all of the cabs they're all th flat rate uh, cabs and I guess it's, there's uh, there's was there four or five uh, cab companies yeah something like something that. like that yeah. yeah something like half a dozen I guess it's uh, it's, it's quite competitive um, and so you know they have a hard time raising their prices um, uh, and so it's kind of all by increments, and um, and even when they do, uh, you know, we think of at least for me, you know, we all probably most of us drive. Uh, you know, we, when I think of a cab, I think of you know um, maybe nightlife uh, kind of supported industry, and and really in Lincoln City we have uh, a, a ton of they have a ton of business that occurs during the day um, from retired folks that can't drive. Uh, when they're going to get groceries, they're going to get you know full prescriptions and, and so on and so forth, and also people that um, that kind of uh, uh, I guess cab pool or carb pool um, to get to uh, uh, often probably low income paying jobs that they can't afford to uh, to drive full time. Um, uh, so the cab companies are getting really squeezed right now with the uh, with the increase in gas prices. And then with this increase, it's going to, they're going to have to pass it on to, um, to the citizens. Uh, and I'm kind of feeling a little funny about it. And I'm, I'm wondering if there isn't some place in the middle that, that, uh, that we can meet or if they could, you know, uh, if there was some sort of, you know, uh, more gradual increase uh, to the, uh, to the uh, insurance requirements so that it would be, uh, wouldn't be quite a, a harsh blow. I mean, it was... Uh, um, it, it seemed like this would trickle down to our uh, some of our citizens that are most in need. The the issue is is when when we decided to regulate cabs, uh, we were advised by the city attorney um, that when you regulate something like this, a safety public safety issue, you buy a risk, and what. What we're trying to do um, with insurance is minimize the city's exposure. We can reduce that requirement. The offset is it increases our exposure. So it's a balancing act, um, and and you're free to do it. Um, well, we've we've talked about you know um, when we're introducing. I mean, this is almost equivalent to a tax. I mean, uh, we, we've talked about uh, when introducing, you know, new financial burdens on, on people, to, you know, the ramping in of it, uh, you know, is that, you know, could we have like something that would get progressive? I don't know. I, you know, I, you know, I, I can't uh, research it uh, myself uh, as far as what what the cost increase is per, per increment, you know, but it seems like if we would, you know, do that for other folks that we might do it for people that would be affected on a day-to-day -day basis like this, you know, five dollars for an increase in cab fare can... Well, I really think we on. had some of that testimony at the last meeting as to how much the increase would be. Right, it's by a third. Yeah. 
which is significant when you have a, a lot of cams. Um, I mean, for us, you know, we go from 500 to a million. Um, I think it's, you know, like for general liability, it's, you know, 30 bucks extra a month, but obviously we're not. Uh, Councilor, I guess um, I, I hear that the concern, and I think the reality is um, cost gets passed down or sure. to, to the user. In this case, that would be the consumer utilizing cab services. Um, I guess I'm, I'm balancing it, as I recall, the city attorney saying even the million-dollar uh, request is less than um, statute, uh, state statute. So we already have reduced, you know, granted, we, we moved, I think, from 500 up to a million, um, but we're below the state's hurdle. Mm -hmm. um, I also think I, I don't have we're right probably below right terminology. The, we're probably right. below the state's, uh, you know, household income level as oh, well. Mo I'm not to no, I, no, I agree. I guess my, my question in the logic is, um, isn't it, yes, it will be passed down. Um, that would be expected. Um, interestingly, we, we haven't heard from any consumers. We've heard from cab companies, and I, I appreciate their concern for their ridership. Um, Though I bet if there were less cabs, um, I, I'm, I don't know if five, just to pick on the five cab companies in Lincoln City, you know, whether they can all make a living. Um, and, you know, if there were three, maybe more users go to fewer cabs. I, I don't know the word capacity. Um, and so, you know, perhaps the margin wouldn't have to be as high. You know, I wouldn't have to jump it up. Because the million dollars is whether there's one rider or two riders. Well, sure. I, if I have know, five riders, I, I could split it over. I think in, in most, you know, even if there wasn't a tight margin, an increase in your your back end is gonna is gonna increase your your rider fees. You know, I I've, I've, I have a business, and you know, if we have an increase in our uh, in our overhead. Yeah. We, you know, our our customers see it. You know, I mean, that's it. You know, not many, not many. There's not there's not a whole lot of benevolent private. Right. right. So the, the that, question that is, are, are you suggesting that the you know cab ridership should be subsidized, you know, by the public at large? No. What I'm suggesting is is that you know if if we're you know proposing a uh, such a significant raise in uh, in overhead for the cab companies that. Uh, perhaps uh, I was trying to find some sort of middle ground. You know, obviously they prefer no raise. Um, the city would prefer a five million dollar raise if they could. You know, is, is there, if there's somewhere in the middle, you know, between five hundred thousand and a mill that might provide some sort of economic relief, mm -hmm. um, not just for the cab companies. Uh, obviously, the cab companies is the middleman. This is a, you know, a, and again, I, I I really don't have um, much concern for folks that that need a lift after being out at the bars at night, I'm more concerned with the folks that are, you know, going to get their groceries or, or having to get to work by a certain time uh, and are in that, that tough spot, that minimum wage spot where it's you can't afford a car, you know, but you still have to get to work. And, you know, I mean, th these are people that one thing kind of goes sideways in their in their day to day and it can really affect, uh, you know, their, their budget. Um, and again, you know, I think all of us here, we don't have to worry about that, being able to probably drive to council tonight. Um, but, you know, there's a significant portion of our you know, uh, citizenry that, that does. And, and I get all I, the only point, I, I hear you, I, mm -hmm. all I'm sure. asking, so if you can, in, but if you reduce insurance amount. I'm not saying reduce from what's required right now. I'm saying. No, from the million. You know, it, it's say it's 500 now, rather than not go to the million, something in between. Are you not, in fact, having the city take on the gap risk? I wouldn't say that the city's taking on any additional risk. The city actually in decreases their liability from where it currently stands. That's a good point. So it's, 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 some about, jump, it's about progress, right? <laughs> Do you mind if I turn to the insurance guy at my other end and... Is there any enlightenment you can share with us, Councillor Sprague? I think so. First of all, the way that this ordinance is written, uh, for a 500,000 per occurrence, 
in a combined single limit, uh, that doesn't work because then you're saying you want a million in the aggregate. That's not the way insurance is written. Uh, secondly, uh, you're saying that it has to be written on an occurrence, not a claims made basis. And I dare say that it's going to be almost impossible to find a, a uh, uh, insurance company who will write it on an occurrence basis because um, the, most of the companies that are willing, at least in my experience, to write a cab company are in the non-standard market. And the only claims, I mean, the only policies available uh, in that market are claims-made policies. So I, I would not vote for this just for the, if the, just because of that one right there. But getting back to the uh, the liability limits, cab companies are held to the highest degree of care. So if you crash your car, um, there may be a question about whether or not you were really legally liable. But boy, when you're when you're carrying passengers, you are held to the very highest degree of care, and it's very hard to get out of if there's a slight bit of negligence you're had. So uh, what I'm getting at is that uh, I am not willing to uh, reduce the amount of insurance that we've got. In fact, I would say that we should have a million combined single limit. Five hundred thousand dollars anymore barely covers the defense costs in a serious accident, and. Uh, uh, it was 15 years ago, I think it was, when the first claim came through in Oregon for a million dollars, and we were shocked. Nowadays, a million dollars is a drop in the bucket when it comes to serious auto claims. And uh, we had cab companies running around uh, 20 years ago with no insurance at all, we, and we did not have any proof of insurance. I think we should have a certificate of insurance from the insurance company that's writing it for the companies that we are licensing. And that should be on file so that we know that their, their policy is, uh, is active. And there should be a clause in there that states that if the policy lapses, the, uh, that the insurance company notifies us that the policy has lapsed. And then we can pull the license of the cab company. I think the, the more regulation we can have on cabs, uh, the better. So how do you address um, the concern Councillor Ward has raised um, for the user of the cab, because um, ultimately it costs money, and it's passed on, and it's passed on. Right. So, can you shed any light? There's no way to uh, to address that uh, because the insurance is is going to cost, and we need to have as high a limits as we can possibly have for cabs because uh, uh, they're. I mean, they're they're responsible for uh, carrying people around for a, a fee, and uh, the uh, exposure is the greatest that you're going to get. Okay. Gary, Mr. Mayor, I you know um, I'm really grateful Alex uh, has thought thought about this and his sensitivity to it. There's a couple of things I'd like to mention. When when we do things like this, I like to remember back of, to how it kind of all came to a head, so to speak. And there was an accident before the city was regulating cabs that involved a cab, and it was unfortunate, but fortunate that there were no riders. But the the cab driver um, was killed, and it was here in Lincoln City. And um, then there were some other issues that came up. Uh, after the accident, which I think to Mr. Hawker's credit, um, you know, of wanting to do the right thing for the uh, cab riding public, you know, the city got involved in this regulation. And it's like no good deed, you know, kind of goes unpunished sometimes. But this is just a necessary part of that uh, process. And um, I, I would also like to remind people, and I'm not trying to be... Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to be helpful, and that is there's a bus running up and down this town all day long, practically every 35 or 40 minutes. If you combine the buses out of Newport that go through and go back to Newport and the loop buses, and there's also a dial-a-ride bus. And um, I'm not trying to suggest someone uh, mm -hmm. not use a cab, uh, but that that is uh, an option. And the insurance has gone up for them, but it's not being passed along to the uh, rider. 
so you can still ride a bus um, if you buy a packet of tickets for less than a dollar. Councilor Sprague, um, what I heard you say, you, you have some concerns about the wording in the insurance category. Would Could I ask you to, if we could perhaps defer this, because I, I don't think there's any time urgency on it, is, and ask you to work with um, legal counsel for the proper wording using your insurance expertise and the then and your outreach to the actual insurance sure. industry. I'd be happy um, to do that. I think, th no, when is she leaving? Uh, well, she'll be back towards the end of the month. And so will I. So I guess that'll work out of all this <laughs> fine. <laughs> but if we could. The, the section about uh, notification, um, C says, and I don't know if this works or not, but C says the policy required in this section shall include a statement that the policy is not cancelable nor the coverage reducible except on 30 days prior written notice to the police department which gives us time to go through a, a revocation process I think the policies we've been getting have had that Some, uh, the problem is is not whether the company wants to cancel it the problem is has it has it gone 30 days since the, uh, the the they didn't make the premium and there was no coverage, and then you got they have 30 days to uh, to uh, advise you. There's 30 days where they're driving uninsured, and then an accident occurs. Now we're on the hook potentially. So uh, when when as soon as a uh, uh, there's a non-payment or a cancellation taking place, we need to have immediate notice from the insurance company. And I don't know whether that's the way that this is set up or not. I think it is. Um Anyway, um, you're welcome to. There again, we can we can do that too. Other uh, other comments? Yeah. I have one. Okay. I still have a question if that if this should be done by the police department because when I I went back on the net to try to see how other cities do it, and an awful lot of them, a clerk or a different department handling. They don't take somebody who has got, been through law enforcement training and take him off the street or something to have him do something like this. Mr. Mayor, yeah. you know, when you said that before, Gordy, I, I looked at that too, and I think people in some of those cities are dealing with a lot more cabs than we have. You know, we have a relative few number. And Both so, ways here. I didn't see the number making any big difference. I mean, if you have if you have a whole lot of people getting licenses, then you need kind of a department to deal with it. You know, like a department that deals with taxi cab licenses. <coughs> I don't disagree with your concern, and that's why we raised it at last meeting. But I, I didn't have a, a good alternative, um, and as I heard from the chief. Um, he seemed to, to make uh, enough uh, argument that enough things happen at the police department. Um, I, I would agree that previously it, it certainly didn't belong with the city recorder. Um, no. But I, you know, absent something else, um, I, I don't disagree. And I, I like, quite frankly, uh, that kind of a look at these is what's the process and does it make sense? Um, but I, I haven't been able to find the alternative Where to uh, put it yeah so it's but i think it's a good thing kind of a hold and be uh, we're thinking about the on the right way but yeah, it seems like it's a policeman is overclassified for that job yeah um so why don't we then again any uh nobody from the public wishes to make any comments then if we can uh help why don't you, yeah, come on up, Gene, if you, because this is the time for comments. This mic or that one? Both. Oh, okay. They're wide open. Gene Scratton, A1 Beach Rentals and Whistling Winds Motel. Just a thought I was thinking of. I'd be curious to see how many taxi accidents that have had over $500,000 claims in Lincoln City in the last 50 years. I'm sure zero or close to it. So, like I said, the liability there is kind of limited. It's really almost a public service 
because like say when customers come out to our places or the motel or bachelorette party, bachelor party, we say, hey, you can get a taxi for five or, well, it used to be five dollars, but seven dollars, and they just can't believe it. So it gets a lot of people out of the cars. I don't know if you read the uh, news guard, how many DUIs are in this town, but all it would do, to, I think, would add to the DUIs because you got this huge amount of people that come down on the weekends and they're going to the casino, they're going out drinking. I think there's 13 bars in this town. And especially the younger kids, they're more uh, open to taking taxi cabs. I know us older people aren't quite as open to it, but uh, they're really open to taking taxis. I have three kids, four kids actually, and they come down, they come down with their friends and stuff, and they always taxi it because it's just so cheap. So, like I said, I think you've got to look at the risks, you know, of um, the tax. I know insurance agents always think one way, and that's why I have a, a relative as a tax or as an <clears throat> insurance person. But uh, I would think, you know, those bike paths down Jetty Street, if one of the kids were pulling one of their babies in one of those little carts behind there and the, and the, the path wasn't planned out right and someone hit them and killed them, I would think there would be a lot of liability there, too. But I think it's just a, being this is a tourist town, it keeps a lot of tourists that are drinking in the evenings off the road. And I know those guys don't make a lot of money because my son-in-law always talks about this one cab. They took when they opened the door, it fell off. So, I mean, you know, I don't think they're making gobs of money. So I think that's something to consider. It's more of a public service and safety to people. Thank you. Good point. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, why don't we move on then? And, and Roger, if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we're going to uh, not participate in this uh, ordinance that's later on down a vote on it but rather buy some time um, and have you work uh, with the city attorney um, and perfect the wording on the insurance piece Good. is that and then we'll come I, back I think it might be useful let me throw a challenge out to the cab companies to give us um, some financial records that would demonstrate what percentage of the insurance is in the fair um, in order to know that we'd have to have some idea of, of income a number of fares whatever um, I, I don't think it's fair to just say I mean to say that insurance costs will go up a third well okay how, what percentage is insurance of of the overall cost excellent point and I'd like to see some records on that to, to establish that are we are we talking about a 20 cent fare increase? Are we talking about a 50 cent fare increase? I, I mean, I really don't know. Good point. Thank you. All right. Moving on, then we have another item for discussion and comment is an opportunity to receive public comment regarding proposed fee increases for parks as described in resolution number 2012 06. And I'll bet uh, there was an attachment with the resolution where you saw the um, price increases, and perhaps we could have uh, Gail come back and want to talk about these prices. These proposed prices were originally part of the uh, community center proposed fees that we brought before you earlier this year, but we took them out until the parks board had a chance to look at the fees and approve them, which took a couple of months because they were vacant a few spots, but in their meeting last month they unanimously approved these changes. Um, one thing that we tried to do with a proposal, um, in addition to going up about um, anywhere from 12 to 15 percent is to um, take some basic day use fees, break them down into hourly fees so that a person doesn't have to rent a park for an entire day. They can, um, for example, Kurtzis Park or the skate park rent by the hour at a time. We also divided the fees into um, three categories, commercial, private, and nonprofit, um, to give some folks a break who are nonprofits and then um, the commercial users charge them um, what's appropriate? What's the difference between private and commercial? How would you a private would be just an individual. I want to have a birthday party, a <coughs> reunion, or something. Okay. Right, right. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I noticed the three categories, or in essence, we're really talking about the baseball parks, the skate park, and then 
you know, uh, shelters and whatnot at parks or picnic areas or mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. I'm always curious of um, as far as revenue from from this these categories. Was there a, do you have an idea of revenue stream from last year and year to date? I don't have that number with me, but I know it's minimal. Um, the most rented park in this group is uh, Regatta Park, mm-hmm. and I believe it was rented about 30 times last year. Do we not? We don't charge then to the youth leagues and stuff for the use of the parks. We don't so, charge the youth leagues. We do charge the adult softball league, okay. and there is a rate for them. Um, of course, you know the mush ballers are coming right. to town. They pay. Um, the standard fee for the ball field. The skateboard park is rented maybe a couple of times a year. Um, one is for the Oregon Trifecta, which did not happen last year. They went to another skate park um, besides ours. It does take a special use permit to run the, to rent the skate park for a day. So again, there, there's not an issue of capacity, so we've got plenty of ta- uh, space. Ha- have we... Um, <coughs> You know, I always question about raising fees versus reducing. Would would we conceivably get more use at a lower fee? Uh, not that the fees are extremely or uh, large to begin with, but um, we did check with other park rental fees around you know the area, um, Newport and beyond, and some other parks and rec districts, and ours are very low compared to theirs. Yeah. I was trying to think of a way to generate even more usage and income rather than, you know, because the, the dollars were actually very small, I, I thought, in increases. So Well, we hope to increase our marketing, and that's one um, place I think our online registration will help because they'll have photos of the parks. It'll be right there. People clicking through our other activities mm-hmm. will, might be able to say, hey, you know, we can have a family reunion there. We can rent this for a birthday party. So... Yeah, that raises a point. Do we have a link or using the VCB websites and stuff that mm-hmm. there's a... I do work with the VCB. So yes. they that someone going through the VCB website would know that we have facilities available. And yes. Great. yes. Okay. And if they get inquiries, they pass them on to me and vice versa right. as well. Other questions? Yes, Counselor. Uh, out of these individual fields... Uh, groups, uh, where do the mush ballers uh, fit? I believe they use two of the fields. Oh, you mean the, for the rental? What category? Yeah, yeah. what category? They and, and are a private price? group. Pardon? They're a private group. A private group. Um, and are they are they uh, reg- uh, registered for this year? They have not paid any fees yet. No. And are they aware of the increase in? Yes. Fees? yes. Well, they are. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because that's a group that come, has come for years, and uh, I hate to see them not come. Mm-hmm. When they made initial contact with me and we penciled them in the book, I let them know that this proposal was going before council. So. Okay. Other observations, thoughts, feelings um, on this issue? Yeah, they are. The thing I remember when we discussed, you know, raising the community center rate was everybody that testified, they were people that were using the community center, thought we should raise it even more. So um, I think we're doing a good job. (laughs) Yeah, I guess I wanted to make sure that uh, this wasn't going to adversely affect the youth leagues and, uh, you know, some of the kids. Because I want to make sure the kids are... um, having finding exercise and having availability yeah. we so have a cooperative use agreement with the youth league so okay um, good. Have there, there. Um, do we need to say that in here uh, not not that, that we have a cooperative um, but don't we need to pencil uh, to add in an exception here or a zero fee we could because otherwise, we're going to get an argument from somebody that says we're not charging something we should be charging, and hmm. I'm going to be up here red-faced. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I would I would think, to for the point of clarification, that would be an excellent idea. 
Okay. Question. Gail, uh, would it be fair to say that um, the we're, we're attempting to minimize the subsidy that the city pays in order to support the parks? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Through the rentals, yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions from council? All right. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Let me see if there's any comments from the uh, public, because this would definitely be the time that uh, the public make their comments known regarding uh, the proposed fee increases for parks. Hearing none. Okay. Uh, I have one question of procedure, and that is if we're going to amend this, do we just amend it by voice, or do we have to bring it back with, uh, with the, the, word, the wording? No, it's substantively the same. It, only if you'd make wholesale changes would we need to bring it back. So you can go ahead and add the... Uh, uh, the, the I, I just included the motion of adoption that, that, um, to amend it to include um, no fee for... Youth leagues? Youth leagues. Okay. For, I, I would say for authorized youth leagues, um, somebody's going to try to use that loophole in, in ways that you can't imagine. Okay. Uh, with that, then, uh, we'll go to our next uh, item, which is actually the resolution, resolution number 2012-06. A resolution of the City of Lincoln City repealing resolution number 2009-30 and adopting a new comprehensive parks and recreation administrative fee schedule. I take a motion to approve with modification. I would move that. I'll second it. We have a uh, motion to approve with uh, modifying and adding wording to the fee schedule of uh, referencing no fee for authorized youth leagues. Uh, resolution number 2012-06, a resolution of the City of Lincoln City repealing resolutions number 2009-30 and adopting a new comprehensive parks and recreation administ administrative fee schedule. Is that just uh, all those in favor say aye? Aye. aye. Opposed with an A. Hearing none. Thank you. Uh, item K17 it was the ordinance for adoption on the tax cab, and we're going to uh, just pull that and bring it back later um, with a little more work and clarification. If we're going to have the public hearing still open... Actually, I, I, it's not a public hearing. I was informed... Um, that's... That's that was right. the same I'm mistake sorry. I got too. I'm sorry, and we're I on. know the difference. But um, so we're, we don't need to notice it then. Okay, that's, that was my understanding. Yep. But we allow comment time and encourage comment time. So I think we're safe. We are. Or we'll hear about it. No, we're in, safe. Uh, okay, then this would be the time for additional comments um, from citizens present on non-agenda items and we actually had another sign up Mr. Kip Ward um, please come forward Uh, my name is Kip Ward. I'm at 4417 Southwest Highway 101 in Lincoln City. And I'll just take just a minute. Um, hearing the, I'm uh, making a comment regarding the, uh, the, the dog park. And uh, I heard Beach Park's name mentioned. And so I just thought I would just add for a little bit of clarification. Um, this is last four or five years has been pretty tough on the animals. Um, there's an old saying that said, well, uh, poverty walks in the door, love goes out the window. And uh, unfortunately, that's true. And our most vulnerable are kids and our pets. And uh, we've really gone through it the last four or five years. And most of you on the council have 
actually uh, opened up your pocketbooks and thrown money at it. In this game, uh, for the Beach Park folks, uh, we not only have some skin in the game, we got arms and legs, and uh, we're, we're making headway. We made uh, over $7,000 at the last auction event at the eventuary, and, and all of that money goes into the Beach Park program. One of the things I did want to make clear is that the, the Beach Park program is not a nonprofit. Uh, however, all the money that we do take in goes to the Humane Society and it's put in a category that's reserved for the Beach Park program, which is the free care for pets from people, from folks that don't have means. Um, unfortunately, while the Beach Park is full on that end, uh, on the Humane Society's end, on the spay and neuter program, they're running out of money. So it's like running in quicksand. You get one thing held up and then the other thing falls down. Uh, so we are going to be having, uh, there's a point to all this, we are, <laughs> uh, we are going to be having another auction in the near future and we would certainly uh, appreciate any uh, donations as far as merchandise or anything that we can auction off to provide money that will go to the Humane Society. Uh, so our mission is a little bit different than the, the beach park or the dog park. Uh, even though they may rhyme, uh, the meaning's a, a, a little bit different. And right now we have 100% of a very small pie, and it's our hope. Uh, I would love to get my hands on the 696 people if they gave their phone numbers or addresses because we're getting pretty good at raising money, and it's another 696 doors I could knock on. Um, but um, it's our hope that working with these 696 people that we can in fact make a, a larger pie and with a larger pie maybe they can have a slice too and working together is, uh, we can make a, a better pet friendly community and as far as location I would hope that you folks find a spot on 101 maybe coming into Taft because nothing says welcome to someone that has dogs than a big dog park sign so anyway that's, those are my comments Thank you, Mr. Ward. What what I heard you saying is that you'd be as cooperative as you could be with the uh, 696 right. potential players. In That's right, game. and we're happy to work together. And, and we're actually learning. You know, you do it wrong enough times, and I'm still doing it wrong, but just less wrong. Uh, starting to learn the paths of being able to generate income, and uh, for you know, it is a community problem. And uh, where it's actually a community problem that's being held, uh, that's being taken care of privately among concerned members. And, you know, being a small government person, I'd love to see that. So, great. And, and just to be clear, when you say the Beach Park is uh, not a nonprofit, you just mean it's like a non, not a nonprofit entity. Right. Yeah. And, and actually, we're, getting, we're working towards getting our nonprofit status. Uh, uh, Doug Holbrook, who is an ex-city councilor here and a wonderful attorney in town, is working to do that. But even after we reach our non-profit status, we're still going to sh put the money to the uh, Humane Society. There's no need to duplicate their administrative efforts. It's just easier to write a check out to them and let them do the work. And they do great work. That's great. Yep. Other, other questions, Mr. Ward? Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, oh. I don't know if this is the appropriate place, but I would like to ask a quick question. You know the uh, ballot, the uh, vote that's coming up for... Which I know nothing about, but go ahead, yeah. Oh, okay. No, I don't have a question. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Other comments from the public? Hi, Don Williams, 2625 Southwest Dune. Um, speaking on behalf of the Bay Area Merchants Association tonight, or as we like to say, BAMA. Um, at our last meeting, and at several meetings, we've had discussions about how to draw volunteers together with events that we've created. Um, we have a uh, bike rodeo coming up, which is third year, I believe, <coughs> uh, where we need people to help fit kids to bikes and bike helmets and things like that. So we thought, well, with all the social media out there, why don't we create a space? So we created a Facebook page, uh, Central Oregon Volunteer Bank. No, that's not right. Central Oregon Coast Volunteer Bank. Um, so you can go to that site, uh, post your need, or, or volunteer. Uh, 
we're, we're pretty wide open. Anyone can post what they like. It's also linked to a Twitter account. Um, no exclusions. So hopefully that will help bring some people together uh, for their needs. Um, also wanted to talk about the uh, Bama Flower Basket program going on in Taft on uh, on uh, Southwest 51st Street. Uh, we have sold approximately 22 of 32 available slots. Uh, we could definitely use a few more commitments from people who want to beautify the Taft area. The city maintains those. They have a beautiful irrigation system set up. Um, A.J. Jarvis of Starfish Framing has created a weather-resistant plaque uh, that can be mounted to the base of each um, what's the word I'm looking for? Hanger? <laughs> planter, uh, planter post um, to recognize the people who have donated, whether for their own selves or their organization or a loved one. Uh, so we'll take care of that and we'll set that up and remove that at the end of the season. Um, uh, the bike rodeo, as I mentioned, is on May 19th. And we are seeking volunteers uh, to help with that program, and we're also accepting donations to purchase bicycles. Um, I believe we gave away 10 last year? Yep. 10. 10 bikes. And we'd like to double that this year. So we're looking at an average cost of about 60 to $80 per bike. So you can contact... Uh, Mary Jarvis at Starfish Framing. She's our secretary for Bama. Uh, and then one thing I just wanted to uh, tag on with uh, what Gail had mentioned earlier about dodgeball. Uh, Bama has their own team, the Bama Slammas, and we'll be practicing Thursday night uh, against an unknown opponent <laughs> who we take great pity on. Um, <laughs> but I just do want to encourage people, uh, folks to come out. If you've never played dodgeball, if it's been a long time since you have played, uh, come out and check out what we're doing. We'll have a full explanation of rules and uh, and show you what it takes. It's a real low-cost event. This is one of those things you were talking about, uh, cost to participants, $250 for a team of 10. Uh, I paid, I think, $68 for a season when I was in Portland uh, playing. So 25 bucks a pop is, is a pretty good deal for, for a Friday night out. And the and, uh, cost uh, for equipment is, is dirt cheap. A pair of knee pads and shorts and you're in. So uh, that's all I have. Did you factor in the increase we just passed? On those, uh... <laughs> no. <laughs> I've already written my check, and it's oh, okay. in. Okay. Um, oh, I, I, I will just mention, too, on, on the dog park discussion, um, uh, Bama is definitely uh, looking to get involved in that. Uh, Kip is a member of Bama, and we want to help wherever we can. Um, I own Nelscott Cafe, and we have a dog walk-up window, and we have a dog-friendly deck, and it is amazingly popular and being sought out by visitors. Not just mine, but dog-friendly places. So this is another draw that will help balance the scales between one place or another during a summer or spring visit. So, thank you. Great. Very informative. Thank you, Don, for Thanks bringing so. that forward. Other comments? All right. Hearing none, and I'll down the uh, bank of counselors. Uh, yeah, this, uh, this Saturday uh, at the eventuary um, at 10 a.m. to noon, there's a uh, call to action. Uh, for uh, a community shelter for um, homeless families. Um, Lincoln County, I think, has uh, one uh, 60 um, family backlog or 60 person backlog. And uh, so there's uh, the uh, Lincoln uh, County Health Organization, um, uh, which uh, typically uh, tries to make sure that the homeless students continue their education during their transitional times um, is trying to figure out a way, some sort of system to um, provide a shelter in Lincoln City. So one, uh, one in the county, I think, uh, none in Lincoln City as far as uh, 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 shelters that will accommodate a family. Um, and uh, as I'm sure maybe some of you have heard, um, North uh, Lincoln County, we have kind of a disproportionately high number of uh, uh, homeless youth, homeless students here. It's been an ongoing problem, and uh, we're hoping that, uh, or the help, uh, Lincoln County Help Center is hoping that uh, 
um, some interested parties will show up uh, at the eventuary Saturday at 10 to uh, work on a solution, something that uh, the community can use to, to help facilitate. Uh, That's good. That's a good call out to the public. So Saturday 10 to 2, or 10, 10, to, 10 noon. to noon. 10 to noon at the eventuary. The eventuary, okay. you bet. Thank you. Hmm? Counselor? Uh, no, nothing. This nothing. Thank you. Counselor? Counselor Sprague? Nothing. Okay. Good. Well, let me um, let me report out the uh, the city council of uh, Lincoln City conducted a performance evaluation for the year 2011 of its city manager David Hawker. Uh, David Hawker has been the city manager of Lincoln City for over 12 years, with the average time for city managers being something nearer six years. Council recognized David Hawker's job knowledge and professional development with a rating of good in each of these categories. The citizens of Lincoln City benefit from his years of years with the city and his over 30 years in municipal city management. Planning, organizing, financial management, communications with governing body, communications with employees, creativity, honest, fair, and ethics, and hiring were given acceptable ratings. The City Council was critical of David Hawker's performance in the areas of supervision, delegation, communication with the public, risk management, and leadership by providing these cate categories with a rating of poor in each. Specific details were provided to David Hawker in support of the above noted ratings when Council met with him recently to conduct this evaluation. There was no recommendation for any merit increase in salary. Council understands and recognizes the challenges confronting Mr. Hawker and pledges to work with him to overcome the issues recognized in his performance evaluation. Any comments? We stand adjourned. <laughs>